This program that you're about to listen to is the result of a dream that both Deepak and myself have had for a long, long time. We have been friends for many, many years. We have been colleagues. We have consulted together on many, many projects. We have traveled together around the planet. We have spoken to the same audiences. And always we spoke to each other about someday putting together a program where both of us could dialogue and make presentations and talk about each other's work and and literally contribute one particular project or selection of tapes in which uh, people could hear how they could create the kind of world that they really wanted for themselves, not just in their own personal lives, and not just in their own groups and in their own countries, but in their own planet and universe as well. And so what we have completed here in this program on creating the world the way you really want it to be is a series of three separate dialogues and presentations over a period of several months in which Deepak and myself spoke to large audiences individually and then took the questions and some of the response. So what you are listening to now is the result of three specific talks that we have given both individually and dialoguing together on the subjects of such vast importance to us and to our audiences. Deepak Chopra obviously comes from a medical perspective, having been uh, a medical student and a medical practitioner and a medical doctor, and having a very large practice in uh, Massachusetts for many years. And then uh, leaving that medical practice uh, to uh, open up the Chopra Center for Well-Being in La Jolla, California, and lecturing all around the world on these subjects. Myself, I have been lecturing and, and writing in 16 or 17 books over the past 25 years on these subjects from a more of a Western perspective. What we have done here is combine East and West and medical and non-medical in a single project, which I believe speaks to the heart of how we can create the kind of world that we would really like to see for ourselves. In the first two tapes, we talk about how to get what you really, 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 really want for yourself in your life. And here in my presentation and Deepak's presentation, we speak from our hearts to a live audience at the Chopra Center for Well-Being in La Jolla, California, where so much healing takes place. We spoke to a very excited, wonderful audience who were receptive to these ideas about how to not only ask for what we want, and not only how to go about intending to create it and learning how to manifest it into our lives, but how to have the passion that goes with creating that for ourselves. And the central message here is that each and every one of us have within us the capacity or the power to be able to create for ourselves whatever it is that we have perceived to be missing. I have presented it from the work that I have done in my book, Manifest Your Destiny, The Nine Spiritual Principles for Getting Everything You Want, and for the Meditations for Manifesting CD, which I have been talking about uh, over the past three or four years on um, how to use japa, a meditation technique for attracting into your life what you want. Deepak speaks about it from a perspective of unity consciousness and visionary consciousness and individual consciousness. And we dialogue together using humor and uh, using our own commitment to these principles into not only creating the life that we want for ourselves, but the life that we want for the rest of the planet as well. In the second selection, in the second two tapes, we, have, we also spoke to a group who were at the Chopra Center for Well-Being, who had come from all over the world uh, to spend one week with Deepak and, uh, and his staff at the Chopra Center. And we had an evening presentation in which uh, we took some of the great poets, their wonderful contributions, going back five and six centuries before the birth of Christ, talking about people like Patanjali and Buddha, and going up through the Middle Ages and talking about the contributions of people like Omar Khayyam and St. Francis and some of the poets of the English poets and the Indian poets such as Tagore and um, Keats and Shelley and, and Yeats and more contemporary figures such as Mother Teresa, 
Martin Luther King and uh, Dorothy Parker and so on. And what we have done is taken the wisdom of the ages, a book that I have just published, which is a collection of essays based upon the wisdom of the ages, and some of the work that Deepak has done with his own poetry in uh, his poetry of Rumi and A Gift of Love and so many of the fine uh, books that he has put out in this area as well. And we combine this wisdom of the ages uh, by using poetic examples and the examples of some of our greatest teachers, and not only in their lives what they had to say to us, but in how they lived their lives themselves. And we presented this material in a way in which we can learn from these great masters on what it is that they not only had to say to us, but how they lived their lives. In the third selection, we were speaking in Minneapolis to a large audience of, uh, of people in which uh, we were dialoguing on how to create the world that we really want for ourselves, not just in our own personal lives, but how can we eliminate some of the things such as violence? How can we create more peace within ourselves? And the answers aren't just in being more spiritual and in thinking positive thoughts and understanding from a quantum perspective, from a scientific perspective, as well as a spiritual perspective, then each and every one of us are pieces of this whole. And as pieces of this whole, as pieces of God, we have within us the capacity to be able to create a peaceful world, to be able to create the kind of world where violence is no longer something that we just accept as a form of entertainment nor do we accept it as something that we must just live with. That unity and, and having higher vision is something that each and every one of us can do. As Deepak and I dialogued about this before we made the presentation and during the presentation, it was our, our specific desire to have everybody listening say, there is something I can do. It isn't just something I can read about or I can just think about. I can literally make this planet a better place. I can end war. I can end violence. I can end crime. I can create a peaceful, loving world by my own life example and by the energy that I radiate out and not allowing my energy fields to be contaminated by those who don't believe in our oneness. And so what you have here is a complete program by two people who care very much about each other, by two professionals who often find ourselves at differing uh, parts of the planet at the same time, and we speak to each other on a regular basis. Sometimes I'll talk to Deepak from London, and he'll be in, uh, in South America. Sometimes we will send messages to each other, both in the field, in ways that uh, are almost amusing to each other. I'll want to talk to him about something, and the phone will ring, and it'll be Deepak, or vice versa. We feel deeply committed to these ideals, and we're both very, very proud to have this new program put on the market in which it combines East and West. We have a man who grew up in, in India and became a medical doctor, and we have myself who grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and became a teacher and a person who writes about these ideas of how to improve the quality of life for people. And we were thrown together on this great stage of, of humanity at this time in our lives. And when we met, in the instant that we met, we had a great reverence for each other. And our work together is culminated in this project. I am certain that you will find much to think about as you listen to these tapes and re-listen to them over and over again. Some of the great insights that Deepak offers here I have listened to many times already, and each time I marvel at the brilliance and the conciseness and the way that he expresses it. I have great admiration for this man. I'm proud to be presenting, creating the world the way you really want it to be. And I'm certain, after you listen to this and re-listen, that you'll know in your heart that you, as an individual, as someone who was always connected to God, will know that you, too, can create the kind of world that we all want. God bless you. Namaste. Thank you. Okay, I just want to introduce you to my Uncle Wayne. <laughs> The 
it's always intrigued me that people like Aristotle and Plato and people like uh, Shelley and, and Keats and Yeats and people like Einstein and Pascal and uh, Byron and all of the great poets and thinkers and so on, there's something about the idea that they were breathing the same air that we're breathing. I don't know if you ever consider that. And they, um, they were warmed, their bodies were warmed by the very same sun and they looked at the same moon, and they watched the same stars. And there's a sense of the energy that they sent to us that we still are connected to, and that all of them had great messages to give us. And as I studied all of these people, what I found to be most intriguing is that all of them were really weird. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. So I feel very much at home. <laughs> when I say that, I mean they were, um, they were people who were uh, not, you know, many of them were executed for their ideas. It seems that our society is one in which we look at our troublemakers, and the ones that are alive we give a whole lot of trouble to, and the ones that are dead we honor. You know. <laughs> um, and these honored troublemakers, you know, I studied, I've probably read 10,000 poems uh, just looking for the ones that I wanted to write an essay about what these people were saying to us in their poetry or in their philosophy. And people like John Keats, whom we've all read when we were in high school and so on, and he wrote volumes of poetry. I didn't realize that he died at the age of 25. And Shelley only lived to be 29. Some of these people's experiences, I wrote about Cicero in Rome, and. Uh, when they didn't like what he had to say, they not only did they decapitate him, but they put his head on the form of the speakers uh, in the city of Rome, along with his hands. And they, put, and they let them th stay there for six months so that people could see, this is how we deal with dissenters. And today we consider Cicero to be one of the greatest thinkers and philosophers uh, who laid down the, the foundation for uh, our very democracy. So that these people, who had something very profound to offer us weren't very well received in their day. Two of the people that were most influential in my life were uh, Emerson and Thoreau, who were neighbors in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. Thoreau spent time in prison because he refused to pay taxes to a government that was uh, performing a holocaust back in the 1840s through the Indian Removal Act where President Jackson signed legislation allowing our soldiers to go in and remove these people who had been here for thousands of years and just assassinate them and kill the children and so on, because it was our destiny to do so. And he went to jail protesting this. And Emerson wrote about the necessity of being a nonconformist in his essay on self-reliance. And Thoreau wrote about the necessity of civil disobedience. So that there's something about this spirit. I've often called these people scurvy elephants. For those of you who know my work, I mean, when I was a young boy, I lived in a series of foster homes myself until I was almost 10 in orphanages. And um, I came home from school in the third grade, and I asked the lady that I was living with, her name was Mrs. Scarf, out in Mount Clemens, Michigan, What's a scurvy elephant? She said, I've never heard of such a term. She said, uh, where did you hear it? I said, well, I heard Mrs. Poole, who was my third grade teacher, telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. <laughs> but she called the principal, and the principal said, oh, that's Wayne. He gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element. <laughs> <laughs> in her classroom. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a part of us that has to be scurvy elephants, I use this term. And when I looked at 60 of the greatest thinkers and contributors and philosophers and uh, people who gave us eternal truth, virtually every single one of them were uh, people who were they were independent of the good opinion of other people. They were not concerned with fitting in, with being what somebody else thought that they should be. 
I think probably the most quoted lines in all of English literature is from uh, Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be. And it's the most quoted line because it's probably the most profound question you can ask yourself. But what follows it is even more profound. Whether it is nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and thus by opposing, end them? And it really is a fundamental question. And it's a question that I would like to talk about here in the, in the time that I have at the beginning of this program, this whole idea of what it means to be, however you phrase it, whether you talk about marching to your own drummer or being the person you want to be or whatever. And I think that there is a level of consciousness, a level of awareness that has many names. And Deepak has written a lot about it, and spoken about it. We've spoken about it together in conversations and, and on programs we've done before. In the East, uh, some call it Siddhi consciousness. In the West, some call it Christ consciousness, transcendent consciousness. My teacher, Maslow, talked about it as self-actualization. You know, that there is a level of living that goes beyond just um, what we think of as everyday, ordinary human awareness. Last um, Easter Sunday, I was invited to be on the uh, Today Show up in New York, on the weekend Today Show. And it was at the time when right near here, all of those suicides had taken place, if you recall. The 40 people in the Heaven's Gate, and that was like headlines all around the world. How could 40 people just follow somebody, you know, to their death? And I thought I was going on there to promote a book that I had written, <laughs> which was called Manifest Your Destiny. I might as well get that plug in. But really, they didn't want to talk about that. They were asking me about what happened and what my reaction to it was, which was a normal thing. It was a, it was a spiritual book that I was uh, there to talk about, and it was Easter Sunday. And so they asked me my opinion. And I said, I would really like to have talked to those people for maybe 30 minutes or so in Heaven's Gate. And if I would have had that opportunity, I would have said, number one, that you don't have to get on a spaceship in order to find God. You just have to look deep within yourself. And I think the second thing that I would have told them is that in order to get to the next level, which he was promoting, you don't have to leave your vehicle, which is also what he was promoting. That it's possible to reach the next level in this vehicle, because this is the time to honor this incarnation, to honor who you are and why you are here. And one of the great things that my uh, earliest teacher, Abraham Maslow, taught me was that there are really three things that separate out these highly functioning people that he called self-actualizers from the rest, of, uh, the rest of us in ordinary human awareness. He said the first thing is that these people are independent of the good opinion of other people. And as I studied these great contributors that I've written this uh, book of essays about, I found that every single one of them sort of marched to their own drummer, the music that they heard, independent from the good opinion of others. The second thing he said is that these were people that were detached from outcome. That is, they didn't do what they did in their life in order to receive something for it. They weren't on outcome. They were in what we call process. They were just doing what they do because their heart told them, this is what your heroic mission is. This is what you're here for. And the third thing he said that separated these people out from ordinary human awareness is that these were people who had no investment in power or control over others. This wasn't what their life was about. That their life was much more about being on purpose and letting other people's opinions and how they dealt with things be something that others handled. And if you look at the people in the Heaven's Gate and the, the people who uh, belong to cults and so on, 
the, uh, they violated all three of those principles. Certainly they were not independent of the good opinion of others. That's what they lived for, was this charismatic leader's opinion. And certainly they were attached to outcome. They were headed towards a better one. And this leader, he, as he called himself, was someone who had great power and control over others. It's what, what his life was about. So that whenever I meet anybody who has an investment in power or control over me, or is more concerned with their outcome, or is more concerned with their good opinion, I know that I'm not with what I think of as an authentic person at this highest level. And these are qualities to really look at in your life. I remember when the, I had this explained to me, when uh, Maslow said, uh, when I asked him, what do you mean by self-actualization? He said, these are people who are independent of the good opinion of others. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do from now on. <laughs> I was 27 years old. I'm going to be independent of the good opinion of others. And he gave me this strange look. And I immediately worried about what that look meant. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it would affect my grade, you know. <laughs> so getting to that place where you're independent of the good opinion of others. <laughs> Back in the, uh, in the 70s, in the late 70s and the early 80s, I was a regular on The Tonight Show. I did that show 30 some times and uh, it was uh, about every three or four weeks I would go up there and, and do the show. And then I would go home and I had written this book uh, called Your Erroneous Zone. And it was all about not worrying about other people's approval and all of these kinds of things. And I would go home and I would go on the show and when you go on a show like that, uh, you have seven or eight minutes and you have to say something quick and something light and something funny if you want to get invited back. I would go on and I would tell a little joke or say something amusing or whatever, and then I'd get home and I'd have five or six hundred letters from people from all over the country angry at me about uh, what I had said and how I had said it and so on. So I used to think to myself, why do I let these things bother me? Because they did, and I would find myself, all of the nice letters I would just set aside and say that's nice, but the people that were saying something, I would want to defend myself to these people. And then I came across this wonderful letter that, um, that H.L. Mencken, who was a humorist at the early part of this century, um, had uh, copied. And, and, ev and he, he would write, he was like uh, a, a modern day Voltaire. You know, I mean, he just took on everybody. Or, or Art Buckwald would be another example of uh, with this kind of reporter in the, in the 20s. But he satirized everything. And he had written out in one of his columns to anybody who might send something critical to me, this is my response. <laughs> and he had done it in advance. And I thought it was so good that I had 5,000 copies of it. <laughs> mimeographed. This was before Xerox. <laughs> I had 5,000 copies of this thing mimeographed. And every time I would get back from doing The Tonight Show and I got a, a whole host of these letters, I would just seal 40 or 50 of those into, into an envelope and then just send them off all over the country. And I wanted to be a fly on the wall when they would open them up and read them. You see. Now, I'm far too spiritual today to do such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that I like to tell this says how about... <laughs> think a lot about me. And here's what the letter said. I am sitting here in the smallest room in my house. Now you all know what room that is. <laughs> With your letter of criticism before me. Soon it will be behind me. H. L. Mencken. <laughs> I wouldn't do that today. But it's a great anecdote for talking about how to get yourself to this place in your life where you literally become independent of the good opinion of other people.
without having to uh, to make them appear foolish. And what I want to speak about here is something that I call uh, I have called in in some of my writing and, and tapes and so on manifesting this idea of uh, Siddhi consciousness uh, or Christ consciousness is a is a place in our lives where um, the definition of it that I like best is a definition that says that city consciousness is a consciousness in which there is an absence of a time delay between what it is you are thinking about and having it materialize on the physical plane. So in the New Testament, this is referred to as the gift of fish and loaves. Okay, so that when you want to feed somebody and you don't have any food around and you can't get to a grocery store, if you're living at this level of consciousness, you put your attention on food and you are somehow, your energy connects with that food and it appears. It's called materializing or manifesting or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that here in this program, when it's over, you'll be able to put your attention on having a new BMW in your driveway when you get home and it'll be there. Although I'm not saying it won't happen. My wife knows how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so does yours. <laughs> I just follow her around saying, how do you do that? <laughs> okay. So I'm not saying it's not possible. But what I'm suggesting here, in sort of a humorous way, is that there is the possibility of reducing the amount of time between what it is you put your attention on and having that materialize or show up in your physical world. And what I'm also suggesting is that there is within each and every one of us a capacity to be able to put our attention, our energy, our thoughts, whatever you want to call this invisible world, on what it is that we would like to create or manifest and have it show up in our lives. And in order to get to this place, we have to first of all banish the doubt that it's possible and shift from a belief system to a knowing. Now a belief system is one in which everything that you walked into here this evening with is um, that you believe in, it is just a belief generally is something that has been handed to you by someone outside of yourself. So the tribes, whatever tribes that you showed up in, have taught you and testified and given their experience and told you this is what is possible, this is what is real, this is what reality is, this is your agreement with reality. And we buy into these uh, belief systems and we literally live by these things. But anything that anybody hands us from outside of ourselves comes tainted with doubt, even if it's just a smidgen of doubt, because it comes from the testimony or experience of others. So if somebody tells you something and says, look, this is, this is swimming, and this is what it looks like, and that's water, and you can get into that water, and let me tell you all about it and give you the laws of buoyancy and balance and, uh, and, and all of these kinds of things, and you say, yeah, that's great, and I believe that I can swim. But you don't know how to swim until you make conscious contact with swimming. And so shifting from a belief system to a knowing system is what I'm speaking about here. And most of the things that we believe we can do have been handed to us. The things that we know we can do, like ride a bicycle, dance, make love, dance the Macarena, um, make a lemon meringue pie, whatever, are because we've had conscious contact with it. But in the metaphysical realm, beyond the physical, where it's swimming and dancing and so on, we mostly just know about it. We haven't made conscious contact with it. And I'm suggesting that most of us have forfeited our ability to sort of oscillate or go back and forth between the world that we notice, the world that we see, this physical world of the material, and the source of it. The source of it. And the source of the physical world is not in the physical world. I think the 
summary, the best summary of quantum mechanics is from St. Paul. He said, that which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. Another way of saying that is that particles themselves are not responsible for their own creation. That it takes something more than particles and the physical world to be able to create. And we don't know how to make conscious contact very often with that because we have come through a series of beliefs to believe that God or creator or creation is something that is outside of us. We are not connected to it. We are separate from it. This is what the difference between ego, which is this physicalness that we're in, and the highest part of us, which is the part of us that is the observer, the witness, the noticer. So there's over here the world that we notice, and over here the noticer. In The Course in Miracles, one of the things that I do before I speak to an audience is I always go over that affirmation from the Course. It says, if you knew who walks beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear again. And when you know that, now knowing is conscious contact. Knowing is an absence of doubt. Knowing is what I am suggesting you have to go to, independence from the good opinion of others and knowing. And you might ask yourself, what in the world does being independent of the good opinion of others have to do with manifesting? And that will become abundantly clear in a few moments. And also, this whole idea of being able to know. Because if you try to manifest and attract into your life what you want by staying over here in the world of the ego, particles themselves, which is what this world is about, cannot, cannot make themselves into more particles. They need spirit. And we have to figure out a way to make conscious contact with spirit. So... What I suggest is that there is a method, there is a way to, to get past the belief system and into a knowing. The knowing that I'm speaking about, you know, it is said when Jesus would uh, uh, approach a leper, he didn't approach the leper and say, you know, we haven't been really having a lot of success with leprosy lately. <laughs> In fact, Given your condition, you've got a five-year life expectancy with a 30% chance of survival. There was none of this. You can see all of the doubt that is involved in this kind of an approach to healing. What Jesus would say is, you are healed, and healing would take place. Same with St. Francis. And, and I talked to a great kahuna in Hawaii uh, two summers ago who was at a talk that I was giving, and I asked him, how do you get to be a kahuna? <laughs> Would you take kahuna 101? I mean, <laughs> and he said, kahunas are, are raised on knowing, not on doubt. And he said, when in healing, in the healing world, he said, when a knowing confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. And we bring knowing to a disease process. Now, it takes an abandonment of tribal consciousness and all of the belief systems that you've had to let you get to a place where you are willing to say, I know that I can heal myself. I know that I can attract into my life what I would like. So what I'd like to do in the remaining time that I have is I'd like to present to you a, uh, a means for putting manifesting into your life based upon knowing and based upon being independent of the good opinion of other people and bring it all together. And it goes like this. This has been my observation. What you really, 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 that's four really, <laughs> want you will get. Now the four really stand for this. The first really stands for wish. I wish I could get a promotion. I wish I could get rid of this cold. I wish I could make more money. I wish I could have a better relationship. I wish. We start with a wish. 
So that's the first really. But all, you need all four to manifest. So just wishing is not good enough. You have to go to the second really, and the second really is called desire for me. And desire is different from a wish in that with a desire you are willing to ask. Ask and you shall receive. And those aren't just empty words from a spiritual text. They literally work for me. If I am in a place where I'm writing and I don't seem to know what direction to go or I don't have the right information or whatever, I ask. And invariably, after I ask, the telephone rings. It happened, what, last week or ten, two weeks ago or so. I was sitting in, uh, in Marco Island. The only person that on the planet who had my phone number was my wife and my other wife, Deepak. <laughs> And I'm sitting there thinking about, I'm not sure how to say this, I'm not quite sure, you know, and I'd, I'd really like to have a good quote, and the phone rings, and it's Deepa. And I said, I was just thinking about you and asking if I could get information. He said, well, I got your message in the field. <laughs> I'll let him explain the field, all right? <laughs> and he gave me this wonderful quote from the Ojibwe, if you recall, and, and I wrote in this essay that I was writing exactly what had happened and how it transpired. And I have found that when I stop wishing, I mean, I don't stop wish, but I add to my wishing asking out loud, please cooperate with me in helping me to create what it is that I would like to have in my life. Asking out loud, asking God or whatever God means to you. And, and then stepping back and just watching and just noticing. It's called managing coincidences and synchronicity and some of the things that Deepak will be speaking about. The third really stands for will or intention. You shift from I wish I had it to would you please help me to have it to now adding to that I will create this in my life. I will have this show up for me in my life. I intend to get it. There's no doubt there. And the fourth really stands for passion, or what I call hardening of the will. And when you harden the will, what you do is you eliminate anybody else outside of you sullying your picture or telling you that you can't get it. When I tell people about learning to manifest, I always tell them, whatever you do, don't tell anybody what it is you want to manifest. Don't tell your best friend, don't tell your relatives, don't tell your soulmate. Keep it to yourself. I say, why would you keep it to yourself? Because when you tell somebody else what it is you want to manifest, you immediately move over here into the world of the ego. And you have to defend it, and you have to explain it. And manifesting does not take place from the world of particles. It takes place from the world of the observer, of spirit. So you want to keep the ego out of it as much as you possibly can. And the way to do that is to have it to be a relationship between you and God, whatever God means to you. So you've got wish, desire, intention, and passion. And if you look carefully, at people in your life and in your life experience who have been good at manifesting what they want into their life, you will find that they follow these specifics almost to a T. And they never allow anybody else's opinion or negative assessment to influence them in any way. They have a passion about what it is they want to create. Today, there are no new cases of polio in the world today, or just an isolated few, because of the passionate will and determination of one person who was told, you can't get funding, you can't do it this way, this is not possible, 
this isn't the way we do things, this is the way the scientific community works. And Jonas Salt didn't care about that. I mean, he had that single mind. And when I was reading about people like Michelangelo and da Vinci, I mean, all of the people who told him that the Sistine Chapel couldn't be painted, you can't do such a thing. Imagine laying on your back for four years, not ever thinking about it not being possible to do. Now, that's the good news. <laughs> if you can learn to put your attention on you, what you want, to ask for it, and to intend that it will attract into your life, and be passionate about it, independent of whether anybody else likes it or doesn't like it, you literally will create it. Because you think what you think about is what expands. You act upon your thoughts, as it says in the Old Testament. As you think, so shall you be. It is out of that invisible world that you attract things into your life. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. What you really, 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 for really, don't want, <laughs> you will also get. <laughs> and this is truly the problem for people who are not good at manifesting into their life. Now, I'm speaking about this not as a materializer, but as someone who in 57 years has been able to literally attract whatever I've put my attention on in my life. And it's not because I'm more intelligent, I'm more blessed, I'm luckier, I'm richer, I'm anything like that. It's because I have followed these principles in my life. I have always been a scurvy elephant. <laughs> and I've never listened to anyone out there telling me, I mean, I listen and I'm polite about it, but I left the tribe. I left the tribe a long time ago. They don't know I've left. <laughs> they don't. They still send me invitations to all tribal functions. <laughs> and I rarely attend. And they explain that away by saying, oh, that's Wayne. <laughs> that's just the way he is. You know how he is. You can't tell him anything. That's fine. My mother, who is 81, asked me last week when I was going to get a job. Now, here's what I mean by what you really, 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 really don't want. And this is the crucial part of it, and then I'll sit down and let you talk. If you understand that what you think about is what expands, as you think, so shall you be. This is like every field of spiritual teaching and discipline talks about the power of thought to create into the material world. And if your thoughts are on what you don't want, and that's where you put your inner energy on what you don't want, then what you don't want has to materialize into the physical world. So if you think that you can lose weight by putting your attention on despising being fat, you have to understand that despising being fat is what you will continue to manifest into your life. And if you put your attention on not having enough money, being poor, and disliking being poor, and expect to manifest prosperity into your life from an inner energy system which says, I despise being poor, you have to understand that despising being poor is what you will continue to manifest into your life. And... If you put your attention on what is in your life, just what is, what is is what will continue to manifest into your life. And if you put your attention on what always has been, which is what the tribe will tell you to do, we've always done it this way. If your attention is on what always has been or on the circumstances of your life, then the circumstances of your life and what always has been is what you will continue to manifest into your life. 
So what we have to do is this is like a multiple choice question. It's A, B, C. You can put your attention on what you want. You can put your attention on what you don't want. That's B. Or you can put your attention on what they want for you. That's C. You got those three choices. And if you don't understand that A is the right answer, this isn't going to help you. <laughs> you have to think of your thoughts and your inner world and your capacity to be able to attract things into your life. You have to think of these things as like currency. The currency that you have for bringing into your life what you want is the way that you think. And if you use the currency that you have for bringing into your life what you would like to spend it on what you don't like, don't be surprised if what you don't like keeps showing up. And the people who are not good at manifesting, who will tell you, this is just a lot of nonsense. You can't do this. You can't just think something and then have it work out for you. And they keep wondering why it not working out for you keeps showing up for them in their life. And they will constantly tell you about all the reasons why it can't work, and you never stop to say, but this is how you think all the time. Here's a good way of thinking about it. In the material world, the currency that we have for attracting what we want in our life is called money. Whereas in the metaphysical world, the currency that we have for attracting what we want is called thought. So let's go into the material world just for a moment. In the material world, I give you a million dollars. And I say, here's a bushel full of money. Go to the mall and buy anything you want. This is the currency you have for attracting what you want into your life. And you say, I love this game. <laughs> this is great. So you take this million dollars, and you go to the mall. And the first thing you come to is a store that sells plastic trees. And you look at this plastic tree. Let's say this one over here. You know, that's not plastic. <laughs> and you say, you know, that's the ugliest tree I've ever seen in my life. That thing is hideous. I would never want that tree in my house. It is so ugly. And then you look, and there's a price tag on it, and it says $20,000 for that plastic tree. And you say, that is ridiculous. Here's 20000 Send it home. <laughs> Then you go to the next store, and in the next store they're selling, I don't know, some kind of crazy lamp. And you look at the lamp and you say, ah, oh, they want $10,000 for that hideous thing? I would never want that in my life. Here's 10,000 cents at home. And every single store that you went to in the mall where you had the currency to attract what you do want, but every time you saw something you didn't want, you spent that currency on what you didn't want, you get home and you wonder, how come my house is full of ugly plastic trees and lamps? <laughs> That's exactly what we do when we use our minds to put our attention on what we don't want. I was in Chicago not too long ago. I was doing a book tour. It was in March. And I got picked up by this woman who was sniffling and slivering and stuff coming out of her nose. And it was like, it was disgusting. All right? <laughs> And she's to drive me around for two days, all right? So I looked at my watch, and it was the 25th of March, and that happens to be my oldest son's birthday. And I said, oh, it's an anniversary. She said, what anniversary? I said, oh, nothing. She said, well, what is it? What is it? I said, oh, it's, uh, it's 20 years since uh, I've had a cold. 20 years ago, I had my last cold. <laughs> And here was her reaction. Oh, just what I need. Two days with Mr. Positive. <laughs> He's going to tell me that all you have to do is think good thoughts, and you don't have to get cold. And sure enough, I have to spend my two days with you. <laughs> and I said what I'm trained to say in moments like that. What do you think? <laughs> she said, I think colds are viruses. And they're in the air. And they land on us 
And every once in a while, we're going to get a cold. And we don't need people like you to write books and come around and tell us to feel guilty every time we get a cold. I said, and what has been your experience over the last 20 years? He said, well, I get a cold every once in a while. I said, well, we are in total harmony in this car. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you believe that you should get a cold every once in a while, and you do. I believe you should never get a cold, and I don't. <laughs> Where is the problem? <laughs> she said, well, well, what do you believe? I don't understand it. What do you believe? I said, well, I think colds probably are viruses, too. I don't know that much about it, but I think they're probably viruses. And they land on us, and we have an immune system. And when that virus like that lands on my immune system, I talk to it. <laughs> and I say, look, you've landed on the wrong immune system. <laughs> you are not going to make it here. <laughs> You're not going to thrive here, I'm telling you. But there's a lady in Chicago. <laughs> Who's waiting for you? <laughs> and so I send these people to you, these little viruses to you, about every three years or so. You see, you go around and you look at people who are good at manifesting and attracting into their life, and you try to get them to put their attention on what they don't want, you'll never get them to do it. They will never say, it can't be done. No, I don't want to think like that. They know that if they think something can't be done. now. If you're not doing what you love and loving what you do in your life, you can't reach city consciousness. Because unconditional love is one of the elements of this highest state of awareness. Now, for those of you who aren't able to do what you love, ask yourself why I am not able to do what I love or live the life I love. And what you will find is you will come up with reasons why you can't do it. And you will put your attention on those reasons. I got a mortgage. I've got all these responsibilities. I'm already stuck over here. I've been here for a long time. I can't make this change. I can't do these kinds of things. And instantly, your attention shifts off of living the life that you love onto all the reasons why you can't. And all the reasons why you can't keep showing up. So I would suggest to you that what you do is you shift out of that tribal consciousness. See your life as like a boat heading up the river at 40 knots. And you're standing on the stern, and you're looking down into the water, and you see there, in this metaphor, the wake. And ask yourself these three questions. First of all, number one, what is the wake? The wake is a trail that is left behind. That's all it is, just a trail that is left behind. Second question to ask, what's driving the boat? What's making my life go in this direction? Answer, the present moment energy being generated by the engine, and nothing more is what's making this boat go. That is, how I am processing these moments, these experiences, now. And nothing more is what's making my life go in this way. And the third and most important question to ask yourself, is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? Can a trail that is left behind make a boat go? Answer, it's an illusion. Everything that's back there is just a trail. And it's all the tribal stuff and all the beliefs and all the things that you've been told that are back there. And if you use it to keep you from being able to manifest and attract into your life what you want, you're just living the illusion. Get out of the wake. And as you get out of the wake, Understand that within you, you have the power to always put your attention on what you want. It's a new way of thinking. Catch yourself in every moment that you have your attention on what you don't want. You're going through a struggle, a, a tough divorce. I am only going to put my attention on being happy. And every time I have an inclination to put my thoughts somewhere else, I'm going to bring my thoughts to what it is that I want. With passion, and I will attract it into my life. And you can do that with healing. You can do that with making the job promotion that you want. 
creating the kind of relationship that you want and manifesting anything into your life. Thank you very much. God bless you. Now that you've heard all about the belief system, let's get into the knowing. Huh? <laughs> I think um, Wayne's basically laid out a very good map for how do we get beyond the belief system into the knowing. And that happens through the evolution of our own consciousness. What Wayne has been describing has actually a very beautifully laid out map in the great tradition of Vedanta. Wayne mentioned Jonas Salk, who was a great scientist in this area, a great thinker, great philosopher. And one of the reasons actually I came to San Diego was because Jonas Salk was here. And uh, in my first few weeks, I met him shortly before he died. And Dr. Salk was already talking about metabiological evolution. Meta, as you know, means going beyond. And metabiological evolution, consciousness. He had just begun to talk about it. He was saying the old paradigm was about survival of the fittest. That was biological evolution. And he said the new criterion for fitness is going to be wisdom. He said we're going to be talking about the survival of the wisest in the future. He did not get to articulate the roadmap that he was going to because he died before that could happen. And yet, if you look at the various perennial philosophies of humanity, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy of Emerson and Thoreau and all the great people that Wayne mentioned. And particularly, if you look at Vedanta, which is the culmination of all Vedic thought, you see that there's a very, very clear map laid out for the evolution of consciousness. What Jonas Salk was trying to do was to define that map in biological terms, and that's why I was so attracted to him. Because what he was saying is that the ability to manifest and evolve into these other states of consciousness is a function of how our biology operates. For historical reasons, our biology operates mostly in what is called the fight-flight response. And the reason is that uh, a long time ago in our evolutionary history, we were living in a very fierce environment. We were surrounded by predators. And in order to survive, we had to either run or we had to fight. And that's why we are here. That's why we happen to be around. When I was in medical school, the way we remembered the functions of the limbic system, which controls these very basic and important survival responses are the four F's, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and of course, procreation. <laughs> and <laughs> as a result of that, <laughs> because of that, we are here. All you have to do is watch the news this last few days, and you know what I'm talking about. It's the dominant activity is the four Fs. All our movies are about it, and all our magazines are about it, and all the books we read are about it. So as a result of this, what has also happened is that we have become the predator on planet Earth. If you could look at our planet from somewhere, some good vantage point in space, and ask yourself, who's the most dangerous animal on this planet? I think, undoubtedly, the answer would be Homo sapiens, the human being. We are the only species that kills its own kind, and mostly in the name of God, from before the Crusades to now, in Sarajevo and Sri Lanka and everywhere else, in India as well, the land of spirituality. 
we're the only species that kills other species and has successfully caused the extinction of other species. We're the only species that desecrates and pollutes our own mother, Earth. We're the only species that is now contaminating even space. And yet, we are a paradoxical species. We are the only species who actually writes poetry and creates music and architecture and all kinds of art and science. We are the only species that wonders about the meaning of existence. We are the only animal that asks, uh, where did I come from? What's my life all about? Is there a God? And if she exists, does she care about me? What happens to me after I die? So in a sense, we are a very paradoxical species. And we are at that place in our evolution where we are being asked to make a choice at a crossroads, if you will. Are we going to go the way of the predator or are we going to join hands with the creator and ensure the magnificence and the splendor and the beauty and the sanctity and the sacredness of that which we are a part. And I think the answer seems to be obvious. The choice is very clear. Either risk our own extinction or become creators. So as uh, I've been listening to Wayne, who's been a great inspiration to me, um, he was already writing bestsellers before I was in high school. <laughs> Listening to great pioneers like Dr. Jonas Salk, uh, reading Vedanta, it became clear to me that indeed there is not only a map but a nervous system that allows us to experience that map, not just study it, but actually know it, as Wayne was saying. So I've developed a kind of vocabulary to think about it for my own self. The most primitive response that we have is the fight-flight response. The second most primitive response, which also dominates our society, is what you and I might call the reactive response, where we have a stimulus and without any interval, without any pause, there's an immediate response to that stimulus. And the reactive response is, is in response in a different form. It's the control drama that we engage in, that the ego engages in. Either we exercise that control drama with intimidation or confrontation or argument, or through indifference and stubbornness, or sometimes through manipulation that involves being extremely nice. Carlos Castaneda, in one of his books, says there are only three kinds of behaviors in this control drama, only three kinds of people, the nice, the nasty, and the indifferent. And in order to go beyond the reactive response, you have to actually, as Wayne was saying a few minutes ago, go beyond the stimulus and the response into the little space that's there between the stimulus and the response, where the witness resides. And in Vedic terms, that witness is referred to as sakshi. It's the non-judgmental, independent of the good opinion of others and of all opinions, witness that knows not how to judge or label or define or describe or evaluate or analyze, but just witness. And in the mere witnessing of it, to go beyond the reactive response. And that's much of what we practice through all the spiritual disciplines, including meditation, as to how to get in touch with that witness. To become the independent, non-evaluative, non-analytical, non-judgmental witness 
of whatever is happening. This response, which in a sense began to be elicited by the human nervous system about 6,000 years ago, and it's very interesting that as soon as the human nervous system developed this ability about 6,000 years ago, with the dawn of the age of agriculture, because man or woman or human beings were no longer having to always guard themselves against predators, and there was a little bit of time to go into this restful awareness. Around this time, we had the emergence around the globe of what are called the axial sages, Moses and Buddha and Lao Tzu and Confucius and uh, Socrates and Parmenides and all the great seers arose around the same time throughout the world. They're known as the Axial Sages and much later than Christ and all the great prophets that we look back to came around the same time as soon as St. Paul around the same time as we started to elicit the restful awareness response. Beyond the restful awareness response, the human nervous system developed yet another ability, which is best called the intuitive response. The intuitive response is to go into a mode of awareness where not only can you have that ability to witness, but you have the ability to do what Wayne was saying, ask. You ask in that restful awareness, in that gap, in that transcendent reality, you ask the question. Whatever that question is, or you ask for the gift that you want. And in the mere asking of it, there's a connection with the cosmic mind because you've transcended space-time into a timeless reality in the restful awareness response. You've sent a message to the unified field, and I'll explain what that unified field is in a moment. And that message is now being computed by cosmic intelligence, and the answer is coming from there. So intuition is a mode of intelligence that goes beyond the rational mind. Intuition is a mode of intelligence that is contextual and relational and holistic, It doesn't have a win-lose orientation. It is uh, never based on direct cause and effect. It assumes that for any one thing to happen in our lives, there is a conspiracy of the whole universe. So if this woman gets a cold, it's because she's inviting a pathogen that every one of us is exposed to, but she's already laid the grounds for a different kind of conspiracy. No illness, by the way, is ever due to a pathogen. That's a very, very misleading kind of idea in medicine, that pneumococcal pneumonia occurs because of pneumococcus, or that AIDS occurs because of HIV infection, or that cancer occurs from uh, carcinogen, because lots of us are exposed all the time to all these things, whether they're viruses or carcinogens. Illness is always a conspiracy of improbabilities. It's um, a susceptible host that falls prey to a pathogen. And what we can do is to not be a susceptible host is go beyond these responses, these fear-engendered responses. Intuition really is, is the kind of intelligence that taps into the cosmic mind. So that's the fourth kind of response that we have the ability to elicit. First one was fight flight. The second one was reactive. The third one was uh, restful awareness. The fourth is intuitive. The fifth response, which even goes beyond the intuitive response, is the creative response. As a result of that insight, in the result of the knowingness that you have, as a result of asking the question, and placing the intention is now the ability to create something that never existed before. The creative response, which is a purely human attribute, because we are made in the image of the creator, 
It's a purely human attribute to create something that actually never existed until the moment you create it, whatever that is, whether it's a poem or a piece of music or a scientific discovery, whatever. Beyond the creative response is yet another response, which is the visionary response, which is to have a vision of possibilities that never existed before as a result of your creation. The visionary response is, uh, I have a dream, and I know how to manifest that dream. And it begins with a very little, small incident. Mahatma Gandhi is in, uh, in a train in South Africa, and he's thrown out of it because he has too much melanin in his skin as compared to the English over there. And he suddenly has the vision and the dream that ultimately leads to the demise of the British Empire. Or Rosa Parks is sitting in the back of a bus, and she's asked to move in Mississippi, Alabama, and she suddenly has the vision, and the civil rights movement is born. The visionary response, which goes even beyond the creative response. And then way beyond that is something called the sacred response, which is really what manifestation is all about, is to ask yourself, where's all this creation coming from? What's the source of it? Wayne was mentioning poets, and this is something that Wayne and I have in common, that we really, really admire the great poets of our civilization, because poetry, in many ways, is a raid on the inarticulate. It goes to the source of creation itself. And the great Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, one day he was looking at a field of flowers, and he wrote this poem where he says, where is the fountain? Where is the fountain that throws out these flowers in such a ceaseless outbreak of ecstasy? Where is this coming from? What's the source of creation? And we all have our own kind of interpretations of it. But the source of creation is beyond interpretation. The source of creation is that ultimate ground of creation where we all come from. And in traditional religions, that ground of creation has been referred to, of course, as the cosmic being or God or the source of everything that we consider sacred. And depending on what time we are living in, the interpretation of how we define that cosmic being, in a sense, begins to change. It's not really how we interpret that, as long as we realize that there is a cosmic intelligence, that there is a cosmic being, and we who think are expressions of, contained in, and a product of that cosmic being. So it's not like we are outside. We are inside the whole scheme of things. The human mind, which tries to understand the mind of the creator, is itself a product of so the more you can understand your own mind, you start to eavesdrop on the nature of that mind. There's a prayer that St. Saint, uh, Saint Augustine had. He said, all my life I've been knocking at the door. So what's this field? If you go to a good scientist these days, they'll say, well, there's a lot of work being written about the unified field. Perhaps you've heard that expression, unified field. If you go to a scientist, a quantum field, physicists today, and you ask them, what's the unified field? They'll tell you it's made up of four forces in nature. There are only four forces in nature. The first one is electromagnetism, which is what gives rise to heat, electricity, light, etc. The second one is gravity, which makes the world go around and holds the planets and stars in their place. And the third one is called the strong force, which is the force that holds the nucleus of an atom together. That when you disrupt that, you get a nuclear explosion, so it's the strong force. And then there's a fourth force called the weak interaction, which is basically the force that holds the arrangement of the subatomic particles, which aren't things, which are actually mathematical ghosts, fluctuations of energy and information. Subatomic particles are more like ideas than actual things. And that's all there is. Gravity, electromagnetism, 
strong and weak forces, period, according to everything that we know in the world of science. And what the unified field theorists are now saying to us is that all these forces come from one fundamental force. They're all the same force. So electromagnetism, which is what? What's electromagnetism? It's light, ordinary light, which has a visible part and an invisible part. The invisible part is x-rays and cosmic rays and microwaves and radio waves and television waves and all the stuff that we don't see, but we know how it works because we use it to send fax messages to each other and speak to each other on cellular phones and surf the information highway on the internet. So that's the invisible part of light. And then there's the visible part of light. And ultimately, that's all there is. There's only light. Electromagnetic forces give rise to space-time events, give rise to gravity, give rise to subatomic forces. So when God said, let there be light, he wasn't speaking metaphorically. He was speaking literally. That's what came out of the cosmic mind, light. And you and I are beings of light. And when we go to that place in our awareness where we go beyond the appearance of maya, of physical matter, then we do experience ourselves as beings of light because that's what we are. And this is not just light with elementary particles and forces. This is the light of intelligence because there's a difference between information and intelligence. Information is, everybody knows what information is right now. It's, it's data. But when information starts to feed back on its own self and evolve to higher levels of its own expression so that it becomes intelligent and creative, then it's no longer information. It's no longer dead information. It's intelligence. It's consciousness. So light is full of consciousness. And the unified field is a conscious energy field. It's literally the expression of the mind of God. And in that unified field, in that conscious energy field, one of the things that's built into it is intent. So if you read the book of Genesis, all you see is God said, let there be this, there was this. God said, let there be that, there was that. Because intent was introduced into that conscious energy field, which connects everything with everything else. And more and more scientists are now recognizing that intent is a force in nature. It's not something that happens to us here, right, in our own minds. Intent is a force in nature. There was a scientist around the time of Darwin. His name was Lamarck, and he coined a term called teleology. And ever since then, now scientists are aware that the best way to explain biological mechanisms is to understand the intent behind the, behind the spirit that was in that biological organism. So Lamarck said a uh, camel has a hump because the intent was to navigate the desert for seven days without water. And birds have wings because the intent was, I will fly. And that this is happening all the time. A giraffe has a long neck because the intent was, I'm going to reach up to that tree. And there are millions of examples of intent in nature, homing pigeons, and you and I have talked about monarch butterflies, and all the miracle of nature can be explained because there is intent built into that conscious energy field. One of my good friends, Michael Flynn, who lives in this area uh, and is an attorney and really a great uh, brother, spiritual brother, Whenever I go to his house, um, I open the door. He has a little parakeet. And as soon as I open the door, this parrot starts singing Beach Boy songs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just beginning to wonder, uh, how does a parakeet sing Beach Boy songs? <laughs> you know, he has a complete California accent and everything. <laughs> and the size of a brain of a of a parrot is about one-third of the size of my fingernail. It has, 
rudimentary vocal cords. You couldn't call them vocal cords. It has a beak for a mouth. <laughs> and it sings Beach Boy songs. <laughs> Homing pigeons do the same thing. They trace the, the territory. They can come from anywhere in the world to where they were bred. Or you look at the migration of monarch butterflies. In the last two years, Rupert Sheldrake, who's a great English biologist, has written about various kinds of experiments that clearly, undoubtedly, demonstrate unequivocally that intent is part of the conscious energy field. So if you introduce intent, you immediately change the field. But there's a, there's a trick. And the trick is the intent can't come from the level of the ego. The intent has to come from beyond the ego. You know, I was remember um, many years ago in India, I was, um, this long time ago, as a medical student, we had uh, one day a young yogi come to our physiology lab to show the power of intent. And uh, yogis have these extraordinary abilities, the siddhis that you're talking about. Some of the yogis, and by the way, yogi, yoga, yoke all come from the same root, which means the unification of body, mind, soul, and spirit, and environment. So this young fellow, he was about 28 to 29, a very accomplished yogi from the Himalayas. He came, stood in front of our physiology class, and he took a knife, and he plunged the knife right through his biceps like that. And, you know, if you did that to my biceps, it would probably bleed. Um, it just went right through his biceps and he stood there because to a yogi, a real yogi, this is not a body of flesh and bones. It's a body of consciousness. It's a body of light and light doesn't bleed. And he put this knife right through his uh, biceps and everybody was aghast and completely shocked at what he had done. And then there was somebody in the front row, a physician, of course, a professor of medicine, who introduced the doubt that you talk about. And Wayne says, banish the doubt. And he, he thought this was some kind of a trick. And he mocked the yogi. He said, so what other tricks do you have up your sleeve? And immediately, the yogi's attention shifted from his self to his self-image. Because when you, when you mock somebody, who do you mock? Their ego. The spirit is beyond that. So as soon as his attention shifted from his, ego, from his spirit to his ego, this thing opened up like a fountain of blood. And it sprayed everybody in the front row. And then he was such an expert, he was such an expert that as soon as he recognized what had happened, he immediately let the ego go. And he shifted back into samadhi. And as soon as he did that, this thing stopped as quickly as it had opened, like a faucet. So that's the power of intent. But that intention has to not come from the ego. It has to come from the level of the spirit. It has to come from a place where you have totally and completely, unequivocally relinquished your need for approval. Because the spirit does not need approval. The ego only needs approval. So that was a very important point that Wayne was articulating about being independent of the opinion of others. You know, a couple of years ago, or recently, when I was in Australia, I was giving a lecture at the Australian uh, Royal Society. And suddenly, somebody in the front row interrupted me. And he said, this is a fraud, and this is this, and this is that. And I said, who are you, sir? He said, I'm the president of the Australian Society of Skeptics. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't believe you. The spirit is beyond the ego, has to go there. And when once we start glimpsing that, just once we start glimpsing that, we start to go beyond our ordinary states of consciousness. 
And what the great Vedantic tradition was saying was that these states of consciousness actually create a certain way that the nervous system functions. And in each state that the nervous system functions, it creates its own physiology and creates its own reality. So you begin to escape from so-called ordinary reality. The so-called ordinary reality, which, of course, Wayne has been referring to as the tribal mind. It's the motley group of sages and psychotics and geniuses who can escape that tribal mind. And that's happened throughout the ages. You have to escape that tribal mind. And once you escape that tribal mind, then you begin to see that there are states of consciousness which are beyond the ordinary waking and dreaming and sleeping. The first stage of consciousness is deep sleep, where our nervous system is in a certain stage and you know we respond to stimuli but in a very primitive way. But it's still a state of awareness. Deep sleep is a state of awareness because you can respond to a stimulus. The second state of consciousness is dream where you wake up from that deep sleep into a dream-like state. And you start having some experience in the dream. There's some repertoire of experience. And then when you wake up from the dream state into the third state, it's called the waking state, which is presumably, I hope, what we're in at the moment, at least. Okay? Now we, we look back on the dream and we think, oh, that was just a dream. It wasn't anything real. It was all in my, in my head. And the Vedantist comes along and he says, so is this, all in your head. Okay, you think that there's an external world out there. It isn't. It's a projection of your own awareness. This so-called very physical world is the projection of your awareness in waking state of consciousness. And if you could wake up from this, then it would be as ephemeral, as transient, as temporal as the dream was when you were dreaming. But you woke up from the dream, and then you said, aha, that was a dream. You can wake up from this into the fourth state, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And then you look back at this and say, aha, waking state, how interesting. <laughs> now, people have experienced that now and then in the so-called near-death experience. And you know, I mentioned this patient of mine that I had many years ago. One day he was repairing an antenna on the roof of a neighbor, and he touched a wire that he thought was dead, but it had 12,000 volts of electricity in it. So he got electrocuted. The current went through his body, went through his heart, caused ventricular fibrillation, and he died. That's the mechanism of death in electrocution. He fell from the roof 15 feet below to the ground. That's it. But as his luck would have it, he fell at the precise angle, the precise location, the precise amount of impact to defibrillate him. So when I met him, I asked him, what happened? Bob, he said, God called me. Then he quickly changed his mind. <laughs> and I asked him, what was it like? And he said, it was like waking up from a dream. My whole life flashed across the screen of my consciousness in a few microseconds. And then I went through this tunnel. And you've probably read all this stuff anyway. Now there's so much literature. And then I was in the light. And then beyond the light, a new dimension of existence. Now, since this is many years ago, since then there's been a spate of literature about this experience. But all of the literature says the same thing, all of it. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from Hindu tradition or Christian tradition or Islamic tradition or Sufi tradition. It all says the same thing. A review of the life process as if it was a dream. The whole karma of a whole life kind of flashes across, then a little travel, then the light than a new dimension of existence. It is literally the experience of waking up. Gautama Buddha, who is the founder of Buddhism, on his deathbed, people got around him and they said, who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. He said, are you a prophet? He said, no. He said, uh, are you enlightened? He said, not really. The Buddha said this. He said, then who are you? He said, I'm waking up. I've just woken up from this dream that you call life. He said, this lifetime of ours is as transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. 
a lifetime is like a flash of lightning across the sky, rushing by like a torrent down the steep mountain. But I'm now awake. Walt Whitman, in one of his uh, poems, having the experience of soul or spirit, he says, I must not be awake, for everything looks to me as it never did before. Or else I'm awake for the first time, and all that was before was just a dream. So many people have had that without electrocution. It's the whole point. <laughs> it's the whole point of transcendence, to go beyond samadhi. That's what samadhi is. This is the fourth state of consciousness. This is the state where we are now going beyond the ego into that silent gap, and we're connecting with the cosmic mind. So what happens is synchronicity starts to happen. Why does synchronicity start to happen? Because we've introduced the intent in the field, in the conscious energy field. And it's part of the field. It reorients the field, ask, and you shall receive. The fourth state of consciousness. The fifth state of consciousness, which is beyond samadhi, is called cosmic consciousness. Cosmic consciousness, where the brain functions in a completely different way, where you have the simultaneity of being in this world and not of it. In the Gospel of John, he says, I'm in this world and not of it. And the favorite quote of Wayne's that I have loved to quote from the Gospel of John, he says, uh, Christ says, the works that I do, they shall do also and greater works than these shall they do. Is that the right quote? Even the least among you, greater works than these shall you do. That happens when you are simultaneously operating in both worlds, in the material world and in the spiritual world. That's called cosmic consciousness. It is to have the witness alive and awake in sleeping, dreaming, and wakefulness. So you have the sakshi or the witness fully awake in dream state, in sleep state, and in waking state, which means your body and your mind are in deep sleep, but the witness is watching that. Your body and your mind are in the dream state, but the witness is watching that. Your body and the mind are giving a lecture or playing tennis, and the witness is watching that. So you never lose sight of the witness, no matter what. The witness is always there. This is called cosmic consciousness, the simultaneity of local and non-local awareness. Fifth state. And beyond that is the sixth state, which is called God consciousness, or divine consciousness, where the witness begins to wake up, even in the object of your perception. So you look at this plant, or this flower, and as you look at this flower, even on a perceptual level, you see there are rainbows here, and there's sunshine, and there's earth, and water, and wind, and space. And the whole history of creation, right here in this flower. And then you go beyond that, and you see there's a spirit there. There's a witness there. And the witness is the same as the witness here. So Vedanta says, if you can't find God in this flower, you're not going to find God in some book of religion. God is this life-centered, present moment awareness that allows you, even perceptually, to go beyond the appearance into the reality. This is divine consciousness. You cannot escape God, no matter where you go. In fact, because this witness is everywhere, all at the same time, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and it's right in this moment, as the present moment witnessing awareness that we're in at this moment, how can you avoid it? Vedanta says, spirit is not difficult to find. It's impossible to avoid. All you have to do is have your attention in the right place. Don't let your attention get distracted by the ego. Just give that up. And the Course in Miracles, of course, says, give up all attack thoughts. As soon as you give up, because you know, if you realize that the self here and the self everywhere is the same, every attack thought, no matter who it's directed against, is at yourself. As soon as you give that up, you're right in that field of present moment awareness. And here the synchronicity accelerates to the point where you experience the miraculous. The difference between the invisible and the visible is shortened. This is what manifestation is about. The difference between the time interval between the unmanifest and the manifest gets very 
shortened. So instead of calling it synchronicity or coincidence, you say it's a miracle. Beyond divine consciousness is the final stage of consciousness, which is called unity consciousness, where the spirit within merges with the spirit outside. Saint Augustine again, it says, behold, you were within me, and I outside myself, and there I searched for you. But then I found you within me, and then I found you outside me as well. You were everywhere. And when that individual spirit merges with the cosmic spirit, that state of unity consciousness is beyond our individual personality. It's beyond our skin encapsulated ego. And in this state of consciousness, Vedanta tells us that we experience our individual body and our cosmic body as being one. Normally, we don't experience that. Normally, if you say, this is me, and then this is everybody else. Or this is me, and that's the world. But in unity consciousness, you say, this is me, and that's me, and that's me. The expression, Vedantic expression, I am that, you are that, all this is that, that's all there is. And if you really, really, really get that, then of course, there's nothing more to say. Good night, thanks for coming. <laughs> In unity consciousness, the universe is experienced as our own body. It's also the experience of immortality. Rumi has a great poem about that. He says, let the waters settle, and you will see stars and moon mirrored in your own being. This is the state where we go beyond the miraculous. So there's a road map, and that's a nice thing. The road map has been explored by Walt Whitman, by Emerson, by Thoreau, by all the great sages of the East, by all the great prophets. And now we are beginning to understand that not only is the road map has been explored, but the human nervous system changes its physiology to create those effects. You can actually study brain waves in cosmic consciousness, very different from ordinary waking state of consciousness. So I just wanted to add those words to what a great foundation you laid, Gwen. Thank you very much again. <laughs> What we're going to do now is take uh, a few minutes, maybe a sort of dialogue, and if you have some questions or anything that you would like to ask us, uh, speak up loud. We would like to dialogue about some of these. I just jotted down a few of the things where we really sort of overlap. One of the people that we both admire greatly was a 12th century Sufi poet named Rumi, who wrote 12 poems a day, every day for 12 years, and had a teacher whose name was Sham, was Shams, Shams, whose uh, most of his poetry did not survive. Deepak is putting out a, uh, a beautiful CD that I heard in Greece of poetry of Rumi that he and several well-known people are reciting the poetry. It's just absolutely stunning and magnificent. His teacher, Shams, was said, to have said, I, me, you, he, she, they, these are distinctions which do not exist in the garden of the mystics. And I like to think of my life and being in a situation such as this or a seminar here at the Chopra Center for Wellbeing or wherever as a garden of mystics. The Native Americans put it a little differently. They said, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. <laughs> and when you think of a consciousness that you were speaking about, about this unity consciousness, there's, there's a sense in which you almost have to, you have to be able to see yourself in everyone else. Isn't that uh, kind of what you're saying? I mean, it's like, if you, if you can't see you there, then your ego immediately becomes involved. And it's almost like you have to step back and watch yourself. One of the things that my wife and I did to really dramatically improve quality of our relationship, because sometimes we would say to each other, this, uh, this doesn't sound like love when we would find ourselves talking to each other in ways that neither one of us wanted to do. And we said, well, rather than, 
rather than trying to be right with each other, let's just stop and say, how can we be kind? In other words, how can we make the kind response? And I think the kind response is the unity consciousness response. And I think it's true not just in how we relate to each other as uh, husbands and wives or with our children, but with waiters and waitresses and, and flight attendants and baggage handlers and, and people on the freeways and so on. It's something that we haven't really uh, grasped for ourselves. And it's a way to let this higher part of ourselves, which is where manifesting, I mean, if there was one thing that I said and that Deepak reiterated back and forth is that, that manifestation does not take place from the ego. Particles are not responsible for their own creation. You've got to get over here. And getting over here is, is taking that stance where you see yourself in that person which you are about to attack by making them wrong. And instead saying, I don't have to have an ego here. Thank you for telling me what a jerk I am. <laughs> I needed to hear that. Or whatever. And letting go of that sort of attachment, if you will. To, uh, to be, that's like one of the ways to get to spirit. And when you get to spirit, manifesting becomes something that you create the intent with once you are over once you are out of that physical world and into the witness world and it's something that uh, as a people we're not really good at it's almost like it seems to me as a people we have to have an enemy doesn't it see i mean it's like if we have an enemy we've got someone that we can all we can all be uh, opposed to but now that we don't have any enemies we sort of go after each other you know because we're still into that uh we have to create this, that kind of a relationship in which somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. If you can let go of that in your own life, manifesting becomes a real possibility. I think it's true in healing as well. Yeah. There's the American Indian poem that um, Wayne was talking about. It's a great thing to remember whenever you get caught up in the ego. Because the ego is full of self-importance, and uh, Castaneda also has said that self-importance is a mask for self-pity. That one way you can know whether a person is feeling sorry for themselves is that they act very important, because that's what they're trying to cover up. And so self-importance, self-pity, ego are all the same thing. And this is a Ojibwe poem. It says, now and then, I go about pitying myself, and all the while, my soul is being blown by great winds across the sky. And every time I sort, sort of get caught up in that, you know, I just recite the poem to myself. And, mm. you know, here I'm going about pitying myself, and all the while, my soul is being blown by great winds across the sky. You were mentioning baggage handlers. I, a few weeks ago, I was getting my baggage checked in um, in Chicago, <laughs> Chicago, and there was this uh, young... Did she have a cold? Was it somebody with a cold? Actually, it was a young man. He was probably 18 or 19. He was Afro-American, and he had unbelievable sparkle in his eyes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was loading my bags, and he suddenly, his eyes locked into mine, and he said, Good stuff, man. <laughs> 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 I said, what? He said, good stuff, man. <laughs> so I said, oh, so you understood it. He says, no, <laughs> but it sure sounded true. <laughs> you know, and that's the difference between knowing and rationalizing. Yeah. You don't have to know this. Ever, you know, a child knows this. This is the kind of thing that doesn't need experience because it's timeless. I had a, a great experience this summer, in fact, I don't know if I, I talked about it in Greece, but uh, I don't know if you were in the audience at that time. Uh, <laughs> this past summer, we were on uh, Maui with our entire family, and we have uh, a little girl uh, who was seven at the time, she's now eight, her name is Sage, our youngest daughter. And she has had um, a thing called flat wart uh, on her face since she was about uh, three and a half or four years old. And every time we would take her to any uh, medical doctor, they would always tell us the same thing. These are flat warts. They can't, um, they can't be treated. There's no known uh, cure for it. We don't want to burn them off because they could scar her face. They will go away, 
and so on. And she's heard this, but three and a half years later, not only has she still got them, but they're progressively getting worse. And this past summer, uh, I noticed when she was out in the sun that they were not only around her mouth and around her nose, but they were moving up around her eyes now. So her whole one side of her face is covered with these, uh, with these flat warts. And she never liked the word flat warts. <laughs> she didn't think that that was a nice thing to call them, so she called them her bumps. The person that called them flat warts was her sister, Serena. You know, ugh, you know you've got flat warts. You know. And she hated to hear that word. So we were over on uh, Maui, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a doctor over there. His name's Kenny Mallet, and he's a person who has decided to uh, practice where he loves to be. He's a surfer, and, uh, and he's also a dermatologist. So he decided, I'll open up a practice on Kihei. And, and, and he comes to a lot of uh, talks, and he reads the, the uh, books and the kind of things that Deepak and I do and so on. And he's always sending me things and, uh, and I send him things and so on. A really young, bright, spiritual guy. Um, very unusual in the medical community. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, for him to be attending my lectures. <laughs> And we were over there, and we were getting some sunscreen and doing all these things. And I said to him, would you mind taking a look at Sage's uh, face here? And he said, he looked at it, and he put this big white light on her face. And he said, oh, Sage, he said, uh, you've got flat warts. And right away, she went, oh, great. You know, <laughs> that's what I need. And he said, but the good news is that when you get married, uh, you won't have them. And she's seven. So, I mean, she was really concerned about her wedding day, you see. Uh, he said, they will go away. And there's really no known cure. And all the things that we have been told about these flat warts, you know, there's a virus that's in the skin, it'll go away. And so finally he said to her, he said, you know, but he said, the thing that I, he said, I can't give you any medicine for them. But he said, I have found that inside of you, there is the ability to get rid of these things. That the virus is in you and also the cure is in you. So that if you start talking to these things, and talk to them in a way in which you say, I really accept that you've been with me for three and a half years, but now I would like you to please leave. And you put your energy and your inner healing capacity that you have, you can get rid of these things. And Sage was like, oh, her eyes got real wide and she was listening because she's had these for a long time. And it's, uh, it's troublesome to her, even though she never really acknowledged it outside. And we went back to the uh, place on the other side of the island where we're staying. And when we're on Maui, the kids kind of get go to bed when they want, and they get up when they want, and they have uh, their friends over, and the rooms are filled with, with people, and they go to, they eat what pretty much when they want. It's a freedom time, right? And um, I went into the room about 2.30 in the morning, and all of the kids, all of the children, there's maybe eight or nine kids with their friends, and they're laying on the, you know, all the different uh, air mattresses and so on, and they're all jabbering and talking away. And uh, I over in the corner, there is Sage, and she's under uh, a blanket, on her, uh, on her air mattress. And I reach under the air mattress, and she's got this blanket, and I said, Sage, what are you doing under there, honey? It's almost 3 o'clock. She said, shh. I said, what? She said, I'm talking to my bumps. <laughs> <laughs> and I left, and I walked into the bedroom in the other room, and I said to my wife, I said, hey, guess what? You're not going to believe that Sage is in there talking to her bumps. Isn't that great? <laughs> so that we didn't think any more of it, and the next morning I looked at her, and they were still there, and that night, the next night, and the same thing happened again the next night. I went in there, and she was talking to her bumps. This was now Wednesday. Well, what I want to tell you, well, she'd had these for almost four years. On Friday of that week, four days after she had heard that and been talking to her bumps, not one single bump or flat work was left on her face, and not one has appeared since then. Now... See, but Sage doesn't have an ego. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point. It's an, and I said to her, I said, honey, what did you do with those bumps? She said, they're not bumps, they're flat warts. And I <laughs> she said, I gave them to Serena. <laughs> <laughs> but inside of us is that knowing, is that little child who doesn't say, oh, you know, I can't really heal myself of these things. I don't have the capacity to do that. She has something inside of her. I don't know what you call it in the medical community. What it is is a, an intention. You were talking about intent. And a knowing and an absence of uh, any thought that I can't do this. She was so determined and convinced that she was going to do this 
that the energy to heal herself of something she's had for almost four years is there. And to this day, her face is as clear and smooth as a, as a, as a child could be. It's a very, very important point here, and I want to address this yeah. just from a medical point of view. You know, I trained as an internist and neuroendocrinologist at Harvard and BU and Tufts University in Boston. And I remember, oh, 20 years ago, a patient walking into my office who had just <coughs> been to an oncologist with breast cancer, and she was devastated by the news. Uh, because it was stage four, and you know, to talk about statistics and so on. And I, as soon as she walked in, I said, "Mrs. Smith, I have good news for you, and I have bad news for you. The bad news is you have stage four cancer, which has no cure. And the good news is I'm a quack. <laughs> so maybe I can help you. I think everyone here has heard, and you should tell them about Marcy. Oh yes, yeah, I will. Yeah. Mm. One, the the. The thing to remember here is everyone's heard about the placebo response, right? You've heard about the placebo response where if you sort of have the intention that this drug is going to help me, it creates a physiological response. In fact, in the last 10, 15 years, we know how that happens. If you think that this is a pain-relieving drug that you're taking, then as soon as you take it with that belief, your, your body generates endorphins and encephalins that are more powerful than any heroin you can buy on the street to actually create that analgesic in your body. So the intent gets transformed into a molecule. Placebos work in ulcers and other things, etc. So every time that intent is introduced beyond the ego, it creates a biochemical response. That's what a placebo is. It comes from the Latin word I shall please. That's the origin of the word. What doctors don't know about is the nocebo response. The nocebo is the opposite of the placebo. You say, Mrs. Smith, you've got stage 4 cancer, and uh, the statistics show that in about 6 months, 90% of people will die from it. Now, as soon as she hears that, then she, of course, thinks she's in the 90% who are going to die. She doesn't think about the 10% who are not. And first of all, you know, which something that we don't recognize, even as smart physicians don't recognize this, that statistics actually have nothing to do with prognosis in the patient. It's like saying the average temperature in San Diego for the year is 75 degrees doesn't tell me what today's temperature is. Mm. Okay, or if I say the average income in La Jolla is $100,000, it doesn't tell me what your income is. Statistics never apply, <laughs> never apply to the individual patient. So you cannot prognosticate on statistics. But we do it all the time. We create the nocebo effect, and then we create that whole thing, you know. Statistics, so this is at the risk of being a sexist joke. In medical school, at least one fellow uh, told me this uh, joke. He said, statistics is like a girl in a bikini. What she reveals is obvious. What she conceals is much more interesting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And <laughs> you heard the other one? Nine out of ten statistics are wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Including this one. <laughs> <laughs> Including this one. <laughs> so remember, Nasibo, in, in Australia, they have a custom in the Aborigines. If you don't like somebody, you go to your Australian uh, uh, Aborigine um, uh, no, sorcerer, in shaman, and witch doctor, actually. And you say to the switch doctor, you know, I want to get rid of this person. So he takes this little stick. He does a ritual around it, mantras and or Aborigine sounds and so on. And he tells you, okay, now you point the stick to your enemy. Within 24 hours of pointing the stick, the person starts to get nausea and vomiting. Three days they are dehydrated. In one week they're dead. The Australian government actually outlawed mm. the custom of pointing the stick amongst Aborigines as murder with a lethal weapon. So that's how powerful an idea is. It gets transformed into what you know is being prognosticated. So statistics should be totally ignored. That's message number one. And message number two is don't put your attention on what you don't want. Exactly. If you're trying to get rid of this cancer, don't think of, I don't want to die. Think of, 
how I want to live my life. And, and be cautious about all of the places where you're going to run into the kind of information that will help you to put your attention on what you don't want. Because almost, and that's called the energy field. So the, wh whatever field of energy that you are in, if you allow it to be contaminated by other people who are bringing you down, you will find yourself you know, buying into the very thing that you don't want to create for yourself. So it's like keeping your energy field really clear. That's why you don't share it. You know, if the doctor tells you, you know, you've got uh, six months to live, you, you don't tell anybody about that because people are starting to count the days. You know, and where there's a will, there's a relative. You know, I mean, they're going <laughs> to... How Deepak and I uh, became uh, friends and colleagues was, uh, oh, it must be 10 years or more yeah, back yeah. now that uh, my wife was, uh, was I, I was in Seattle and uh, I got a call from her. I was doing a, a, a book tour in, in Seattle and I got a call from her saying that she had a nodule on her thyroid and that, uh, oh, I mean, it was the worst kind of prognostication. And I thought, you know, that one of the doctors that she had been to said that, she would have to have surgery immediately. She very likely had cancer. She was going to lose her throat. I mean, it was just, and I was devastated. I was going on Good Morning Seattle or something and uh, trying to catch my breath and thinking my wife, who was in her 30s, is, uh, you know. and Deepak's work uh, was just coming out at that time through Nightingale Conan and so on, and I think we were scheduled to appear together on a program in San Francisco, as, as a matter of fact. I called his office, and, uh, and Marcy went to... Uh, the center. It was that, at that time, it was in, uh, in Lancaster, Massachusetts. And Deepak became her physician. She went through the whole Pantacama treatment through, and learned to meditate. And she had never meditated before. And when she learned this meditation process and when she went through all of the, the various uh, massages and all the lectures and the, the whole intense thing that they offer at the Chopra Center, um, well, today, her, you know, she's not, she was told that she would have to be on thyroxin. Uh, you know, an, an artificial thyroid supplement for the rest of her life. She doesn't take anything like that at all. Her thyroid is normal, and she's um, you know healed, been healed of that. And my friend Dr. Chopra here is, is someone that my wife believes saved her life. Yeah. It's a true story. Yeah. You talked the, before, and I did also about this idea of the source. What is the source? You know, you. I remember being a little boy living out at this uh, at this foster home in in Mount Clemens, and we had this practice in the, in the spring where Mrs. Scarf would take a big uh, bag full of dried tomato seeds. I was little. I was four. My brother Dave was five. He was with me. And I was the, uh, the digger. I had this little uh, hand shovel, and I would dig a hole. And Mrs. Scarf would take the dried tomato seeds and put them in the ground. And then I would cover it over. And Dave would uh, take the sprinkler can, and he'd pour water on it. We'd put a stake in there. And then we'd move three feet away, and then we'd do it again. And we did it through this whole plot of land. And I can remember asking, as if this were yesterday, I said to Mrs. Scarf, I said, where do these tomatoes come from? And she said, oh, God brings us the tomatoes. So I said, well, if God brings us the tomatoes, what are we doing all of this for? You know, what's that? <laughs> it seems like a heck of a way to have to do it if God's going to bring us the tomatoes. She said, oh, no, uh, the tomatoes are in the seeds. And I had this idea, like, the tomatoes in the seeds? And as a little boy... I was thinking about that, and my brother was in first grade, or kindergarten, and he had one of those uh, plastic rulers with a magnifying glass on the end of it, you know, that just doubled, and I told him, oh, get your magnifying glass, and we took some of those tomato seeds, and we went out in the back in the chicken coop and cut open the seeds, literally, and I took his magnifying glass, and I'm looking in there for a little miniature tomato. <laughs> <laughs> now, 50 years and more have come and gone, and I know now that what, what Deepak was talking about, when you take that tomato seed and you put it under a microscope and turn up the magnification, first you'll find molecules and mostly spaces and atoms, and then you'll take the spaces out and you put an atom under the microscope and you'll see mostly spaces, and now you see electrons and protons and crutons and neutrons and <laughs> you know, whatever those things are that are in there, right? But it's mostly spaces. Then you take the electron and you put it under an electron microscope and you turn up the magnification, more spaces, mostly spaces and you take out and you get subatomic particles, and you keep going, all you're doing is looking for where the tomato comes from. What's the source of tomato? You get to the tiniest, tiniest sub-atomic sub, sub, sub particle, you put it in a particle accelerator, 
you increase it up to 250,000 miles an hour and collide them, you open up the accelerator and you realize there's nothing there. There's no thing there. And the weirdest part of all is that when you look at it, it changes it. That the observer really affects the creation process. Now you take the same seed that began you. You thought you started at some quantum picnic, right? Uh, nine months <laughs> before, your, uh, before your birth. So you take the seed that began you, and you do the same experiment, whether you just keep turning up the magnification and taking out the space, and guess what? Guess where you came from? No thing. No thing nuts. The source. See, in India, they talk about these people that we've been referring to. People like Jesus, people like Buddha, people like Muhammad. These great spiritual people, they call them non-dual beings. Somehow they've transcended this duality of the physical plane. You know, the physical plane. You've never seen a person with a front who doesn't have a back, have you? you know, a person who is an outside who doesn't have an inside. Everything in the physical world has its opposite. To get past the physical world, you have to go to the world of no duality. And that is the equivalent of zero, mathematically. Zero is the number that you cannot cut in half. There's only one zero. And the equivalent of zero is called silence. The silence is the place where you go to. Melville said God's one and only voice is silence. When you go to silence, you literally go to the place within you that can no longer be divided. And that's where you make conscious contact. That's why meditation, or getting quiet, and discovering that place within you that can no longer be divided, is, the, is really, literally, the source of all manifestation. And no matter where you go, I mean, I've talked to my friend here many times about it, and I'll call him up about something that's bothering me this, and you know what he always says to me? Meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Meditate on it, Wayne. I'll call Rita, I'll say, Rita, this is she say, Meditate. I said, Rita, I'm having a problem with one of my kids. What does she say? Don't meditate. <laughs> right, Rita? I mean, it's a, but the truth of it is, what they're saying is, shatter the illusion of your separateness, which is what meditation does. And make conscious contact. When you go there, then you discover the light that you were talking about, the being of light. And that's why meditation isn't just something that you do to have a peaceful existence. It's something that you do to make <laughs> conscious contact with the creation process and begin to manifest. There's a Vedic expression, in every seed is the promise of a thousand forests and more. Mm. In every seed is the promise of a thousand forests and more. Meditation is that ability to, to go beyond thought. The ability to think is an extraordinary human ability, but even more extraordinary is the ability to not think. <laughs> This concludes Side B. Please go to the next cassette to continue the program. Thank you. We're going to uh, proceed in order of most enlightened down, so I'll be... The senior citizen first. <laughs> he didn't need to say that. You know. We are going to speak about tonight is something actually that... Um, we have never done before. It is not uh, a repeat of anything that uh, you all have heard me talk about, nor Deepak, because we just decided yesterday on how we would present this. We spent the first um, 10 days or so of December of last year uh, on Greece together with our wives. And uh, we spoke to uh, around 1,500 Greek citizens for three days and had a wonderful time. And then we had a couple of days in which we were just um, touring the uh, ancient city and all of the uh, artifacts and so on of, uh, of Athens. We were up on the uh, Parthenon one afternoon, and we had hired a uh, Greek historian, a man in his uh, late 70s, who um, was as expert on Greece because we kept quizzing him on all kinds of every little detail about uh, who lived where and who did what, and he never even um, made close to an error. And we had a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, and we were uh, holding objects in our hands that had been um, created five and six thousand years ago. 
this man would point out that over here is where uh, Socrates was forced to sit and drink hemlock. And I had this awareness at that time that uh, we were walking on the very same ground that uh, Socrates and Aristotle and Pythagoras and Alexander and Demosthenes and so many of the people that we have uh, revered as our ancient teachers that um, we were looking at the very same moon they looked at. We were, if you understand even a little bit about quantum physics and quantum mechanics, we were literally breathing the same air that they were breathing, the same molecules. Our bodies were being warmed by the very same sun that warmed their bodies. And I had, a, um, I had take, decided that I was going to take January and February off to write a book, but it wasn't the book that I came to write. I decided at that time, when we were up there amongst all of these um, ancient artifacts and walking through these uh, thousand-year-old buildings, that um, these people who were here before us are still connected to us. And even if we can't see the connection, even if we can't get a hold of it um, and process it with our senses, nevertheless, there is that connection. And we're beginning to understand that as we learn more and more about subatomic uh, particles and so on. But what they did is that they left us a legacy. And there was something about these people where they were forced by their own passion to uh, write down or record in some fashion uh, what they felt deeply in their hearts. And some of them, for exercising these rights or these activities, were executed. It was a dangerous time to be saying what was on your mind if it didn't agree with what the state thought, as Socrates learned, and so on. And so I went away in January and February and made a decision that I would take 60 of the greatest masters who have uh, been influential in my life, and I would um, immerse myself in their literature and what they had to say, and I would take one selection from them. And then I would write an essay about what it is that they were trying to tell us. And I decided that I could do that in 60 days, 60 essays. Because when you really know what you really, 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 really want, <laughs> and you have a passion about that, there's absolutely nothing that can stop you from doing it which is true of so many of these people that I'll be speaking about in, this op in my opening remarks. Many of them were poets. I'll give you the list and the names in just a few moments. And as I immersed myself in their literature and read as much of their poetry and read as much about their lives as I could, and then I would take a portrait or a photograph, if, the photo if photographs were available, um, of these people who had lived over the last uh, 25 or 30 centuries, and I would put it right in front of my writing table, and I write on a yellow pad. And I would look at their face, and I would ask them, what is it that you would like the people who are now living in the year 1998 to know? What would you say? And it may sound strange to some of you, but um, when you meditate on that and you see their face and you let yourself surrender and let go, what happens is that you begin to reach a different state of consciousness. And I began to feel the presence of these great masters. And I had the experience of what I call automatic writing that I get. Most of the time, up until, now, up until the last few years, I only got it in my dreams when I'd be in a dream state, when I was totally free of my body, I could compose, I could write and just endlessly, and I'd wake up and try to recapture that. I'm sure many of you have had that experience, writing great music or reciting something and just not missing a beat, and then waking up and your tongue is all twisted and you can't remember a word of what it was. But you knew that there was an elevated state there. But when you get into this process of learning to meditate and surrender and 
allow this divine energy to work through you, you can begin to, um, to create at a level that you never thought you could before. And I was literally able to, with very little sleep, in 60 days, read as much as I could about their lives, read as much of their contributions, and write an essay all in a 24-hour period, 60 consecutive days. These people, we have, many of them are, are people that Deepak and I have talked about, are um, considered to be great masters. Some of them, because of the conditions under which they lived, were forced into exile or were vilified for their comments. So what I'd like to do is share with you who they are, share a few of their contributions, and what these people were like. Then Deepak will talk for approximately the same amount of time about poetry and how it can affect your life and play some of the beautiful poetry that he has just put together on a stunning, stunning contribution that I think you're going to find enduring and beautiful. And then we will dialogue together. The people that I included were Pythagoras and Pascal and Buddha and Lao Tzu, Confucius, Patanjali, Cicero, Jesus, Epictetus, Omar Khayyam, St. Francis, Rumi, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, John Donne, John Milton, Alexander Pope, John Keats, Percy Shelley, William Blake, Goethe, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Elizabeth Browning, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Longfellow, Emily Dickinson, Robert Browning, Herman Melville, John Greenleaf Whittier, Lord Tennyson, Walt Whitman, Lewis Carroll, Stephen Crane, Algernon Swinburne, William James, Joyce Kilmer, Ella Wilcox, William Jennings Bryan, Khalil Gibran, Rudyard Kipling, William Butler Yeats, Ravindranath Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, George Bernard Shaw, Yogananda, Kertelyar de Chardin, E. E. Cummings, Robert Frost, Dorothy Parker, Langston Hughes, Martin Luther King, Ogden Nash, and Mother Teresa in the order of their living. And while many others, of course, were excluded, these just happen to be the, the 60 people that I picked. Now, as we talk about the wisdom of the ages and what these contributions that they make say to each and every one of us, there are two things that I want to talk about in this allotted time that I have. The first is what these people were like, and the second is what they had to say. There's a story told of a village where a group of conquerors had come through and had captured a group of the local citizens and imprisoned them as prisoners of war. In that village where these men were held prisoner were four philanthropists who knew of the conditions of the prison. The first philanthropist went to the prison and said, I have a great deal of wealth, and I understand that the men that are in the prison are not given clean water to drink. So I would like to donate my money to have the water purified and cooled so that the men will be comfortable and won't die of dysentery. And that was granted by those who were holding the men prisoner of war. The second philanthropist went to the prison authorities and said, I understand the men do not have blankets to sleep on. I would like to donate blankets for everyone so that they will be comfortable and warm in their cells. And he left feeling that he had fulfilled his dharma. He had, uh, he had done what was expected of someone who had wealth. And he felt good. The third philanthropist discovered that the food that the men were eating was not healthy and they weren't getting enough of it. And he had a farm. And he said, I would like to donate my farm and all of the crops to go to the men who are being held as prisoners and be sure that they are well fed. And so it came about, and he felt good about his contribution. 
The fourth philanthropist was a great avatar, a saint, a great teacher. And what he did is he went and discovered and found out where the keys were. And he went to the prison cell and he unlocked each and every one of the cells and freed the men. So there's a difference between those of us who are philanthropists, who are doing good work, but basically are helping everyone else to suffer in comfort. And those of us who can free others or ourselves from the self-imposed prisons that we live in. These people, these great poets, these great philosophers, these great thinkers, these movers and shakers, these spiritual avatars whose names you've just heard and many others were people who probably most significantly were resistant to enculturation. They didn't feel that it was necessary to fit in. They always were going against the established culture, if you will, or the rules or the, uh, the guidelines that were being provided, the tribes, and how things had always been done. Somehow these were people who knew that if you place your attention on the way things are, then you can never get what you want because the way things are will keep manifesting. These were people who thought things that others didn't think. Some were crucified. Cicero. The age of Cicero is known as the century before the crucifixion. Cicero was considered the greatest orator of his time. And for taking a stand and writing an essay called The Six Mistakes of Man and taking issue with the way Caesar was handling the citizens of Rome, he was executed. His head and his hands were put on display at the Speaker's Forum in Rome. People like that allow people like us today, 2,000 years later, to come and say the things that are in our hearts without fear of uh, being executed. Emerson was vilified for his ideas on established religions and how we should change and what's in it for each and every one of us. Many were crucified. And, but these people, didn't, it didn't make any difference to them. They lived their lives um, with what I can only call passion. They felt somehow they shared this common bond, and this common bond is one which says, I have to do what is inside of me and it's so strong inside of me that I know I'll die if I don't anyway. So I have to do it. You see, most people that I know, my experience has been that most people die with most of their music still in them. And if you look at these people and their lives, you find that uh, that wasn't the case with them. And they were passionate beyond what I can even describe. Probably one of the greatest poets who ever lived was John Keats. Ode to a Grecian urn. Truth is beauty, beauty is truth. That is all there is to know and all ye need to know. The day that I decided to write about the Ode to the Grecian urn and ask John Keats, what would you like me to say to these people 200 years after you've left? I read his life story, and I picked up at the library, it's collected, the collected works of John Keats. It's this thick with several uh, thousand poems in it. And then I was, I was shocked to discover that Keats died at the age of 25, 25 years old. And Shelley died at the age of 29. These people that we revere as great poets and great thinkers. So what they shared is this 
somehow this need, this desire to be able to, to say it and to do it regardless of what others might think. They were, as I've said so many times in many of my talks, they were independent of the good opinion of other people. They were not consumed with whether it was going to be approved of or not approved of. They lived on the edge, but they said what they had to say. This is what they were like, passion, and living the life fullest, and not dying with their music still in them, as so many people have been trained to do. What they had to say, I think, is even more profound. And it's the basis of uh, the wisdom of the ages. I think probably the most significant thing that these people had to offer us is that they lived what uh, Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy. And the perennial philosophy is one in which uh, Huxley looked at all of the different cultures that have ever existed, whether they were primitive or whether they're modern, Eastern or Western, and he looked at all of these people. And he discovered that there was one thing that virtually every culture, every tribe, every organization, every grouping of peoples have in common, and that is that they all had a very strong belief that there is a world beyond the world of the changing. When Lao Tzu was asked the question, what is real, Master, what is real, his response was, that is real, which never changes. So there's the world of the changing. And if you ask yourself the question, what part of me is real, by that definition, it certainly can't be your body, can it? Certainly not mine. <laughs> I was looking in the mirror. I was in Baltimore not too long ago, and I was giving a talk there, and I was uh, just writing down, jotting down some notes about what I wanted to say, and I was sitting at this desk, and alongside of me to the right was this mirrored wall. The whole wall was a mirror. So I'd, every time I would just get through writing something, I'd look up, and I'd look into this wall. There I'd see this face looking back at me. And I'd jot down a few notes, and I'd look up again, and I kept seeing myself. Finally, I just stopped, and I started looking real close. And I said, damn, <laughs> there's an old man renting my face. <laughs> I still can't get over that. <laughs> Every time I shave, I said, who is that in there? Because the, the me in here that is looking out at you and is talking to you hasn't aged at all. I don't feel a bit old. I don't think old. I don't, uh, I don't run my life on any principle of having aged at all. There's no boundaries in here. And these poets, these philosophers, let me share a few of what it is that they offer in this world, in this area of the soul. One, of course, is one of my favorites. His name is Rabindranath Tagore, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature in 1927. And he's talking to God, Krishna. And he says these words. And I wrote them out, and then I wrote an essay about it. He says, um, I went out alone on my way to my tryst. But who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word I utter. He is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame. But I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. There's so much in that little passage. I wrote an entire book about this a few years ago called Your Sacred Self. And the basis of it is that there's really two people in every one of us. There's an ego, 
which is just an idea. You'll never find an ego in an x-ray or an autopsy. It's not anything you can get a hold of. It's just an idea. It's an idea that we carry around that says who I am is separate from you. Who I am is in competition with you. Who I am is what I accumulate, how much stuff I have, how much it's worth. That's who I am. But there's also within each and every one of us another self. And that self is called the sacred self or the higher self. And this higher self doesn't really care whether you're better than anybody else. It's not interested in whether you win or lose or how much you get or who you're better than or how much more stuff you have or how many merit badges you've accumulated. It's not interested in that. It only wants one thing. It just wants you to be at peace. That's all it wants. And as you think about these two selves in you, the one that needs to be right to make somebody else wrong and the one that wants to be at peace, you can really make a shift instantaneously in your life by just in every interaction that you have, as frequently as you can in your life, practice being kind rather than being right. Wherever you are, with whomever, whether it's your spouse or your ex-spouse or your children or your in-laws or your flight attendants or people on the freeway, if we could just begin to look at the part of us that wants to be at peace and let it triumph, let it subdue this part of us that needs to make someone else wrong. And that's what Tagore was talking about, that inside each and every one of us there is that which makes the dust rise from the earth with our swagger. Adds a loud voice to every word it utters. And I am ashamed to come to thy door in this company. It's a very powerful message. A couple of the other selections that these people wrote about soul, I've picked three or four. One is by Herman Melville, great American novelist, 19th century. Listen to this. It's just an observation from Moby Dick. For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. The horrors of the half-lived life. Isn't that a beautiful message? That An insular Tahiti surrounded by an appalling ocean. It's been said that uh, it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. It's the silence between the notes that makes the music. The soul. Emily Dickinson was one of the people that I picked. She said, this quiet dust holding up a handful of dirt was gentlemen and lady and lads and girls, was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. This passive place, a, a summer's nimble mansion where bloom and bees fulfilled their oriental circuit, then ceased like these. Think of that. This quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls with laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. The perennial philosophy of the greatest teachers always points to the soul, the part of us that will endure. One of my very favorites was written by one of the great poets of all time. When I was researching and writing all of this poetry and reading all of this poetry for a couple of months, reading thousands of different poems, almost all of the poets from about the 17th century on referred to the greatest poet 
that they knew as John Milton. John Milton wrote Paradise Lost when he was totally blind in a stone room dictating and listening to someone scratch it out. Imagine in the 1600s having to dictate one of the greatest pieces of writing ever. And he wrote a little poem on time which refers to the soul. Listen to these words of a blind man in the 17th century, over 400 years ago. Fly envious time, and he's like angry at time, till thou run out thy race, call on the lazy leaden stepping hours, whose speed is but the heavy plummet's pace, and glut thyself with what thy womb devours which is no more than what is false and vain, and merely mortal dross. So little is our loss, so little is thy gain. For when, as each thing bad, thou hast entombed time, and last of all thy greedy self consumed, then long eternity shall greet our bliss with an individual kiss. And joy shall overtake us as a flood, when everything that is sincerely good and perfectly divine with truth and peace and love shall ever shine about the supreme throne of him to whose happy making sight alone when once our heavenly guided soul shall climb then all this earthly grossness quit attired with stars we shall forever sit triumphing over death and chance and thee Oh, time. Time. So many of the poets refer to this thing called time as an enemy. And they refer to the internal part that time can never get a hold of. The soul, the spirit, the higher part of each and every one of us. And when we learn to live there, we transcend our fears. We go beyond what we think of as ordinary human awareness. And we enter into, enter into a state called higher consciousness, or higher awareness, or Siddhi consciousness, whatever you name it, mystical awareness. One of the people that Deepak will be speaking about, some of his poetry, his name was Rumi. I used a, a line of his as the display quote for this book. He said, when you are dead, seek for your resting place, not in the earth, but in the hearts of men. In the hearts of men. I brought up here a copy of a couple of books that I think are very profoundly worth your effort. One is written by a friend of Deepak's and mine. Her name is Joan Borisenko. It's called The Ways of the Mystic, Seven Paths to God. And... Um, she talks about a thing called mystical consciousness. The teacher that Rumi had, his name was Shams, once uttered these words, I, you, me, he, she, they. These are distinctions which do not exist in the garden of the mystics. Many of these poets and philosophers and spiritual teachers talk to us about something called connectedness, something called oneness, something that is beyond our ego. It's coming to an awareness that we literally are connected to every single every person that ever is or ever has been, or ever will be. And even though it's invisible, once we can begin to see that oneness, and that's what mystical consciousness is, it's knowing, as the Native Americans say, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. And no cell in any body is so foolish as to fight among themselves and attempt to survive. 
And so when we see ourselves as individual branches on a tree called life, or individual cells in a body called humanity, and we see our connectedness, again, we begin to subdue that ego and our self-importance. I'd like to share just one more with you. It's an excerpt from uh, E.E. E. Cummings. I love a little humor in, in the poetry. And he talks about individual strength, individual personality, having the strength within ourselves to really act on what we know to be true in our hearts. And E.E. E. Cummings was one of those people who took on everybody. He wrote everything in lower cases just to confound, I think, his critics. And here's one of his all-time best that I think speaks to each and every one of us about this higher level of awareness in a very humorous way. He says, here is little Effie's head. Her brains are made of gingerbread. When the judgment day comes, God will find six crumbs. Stooping by the coffin lid, waiting for something to rise, as the somethings always did, you imagine his surprise, bellowing through the general noise, where is Effie, who was dead? To God in a tiny voice, I am made, the first crumb said. Whereupon his fellow five crumbs chuckled as if they were alive, and number two took up the song, Might I'm called, I've done no wrong, cried the third crumb, I am should, and this is my little sister could, with our big brother who is wood. Don't punish us, for we were good. And the last crumb, with some shame, whispered unto God, My name is Must, and with the others, I've been Effie who isn't alive. Cross the threshold, have no dread, lift the sheet back in this way. Here is little Effie's head. Her brains are made of gingerbread. May, must, might, would, could, should. The words of the half-lived life. The poets, the philosophers, the great thinkers, those who are, we revere, all of them stood for something that transcends ordinary human awareness. Not just in what they said, but in how they lived. None of them, not one, died with any of their music in them. And I would encourage you to listen and do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Deepak. It's um, so interesting that if you talk to anyone that has uh, been able to have a vision and you ask them what triggered that, very, very frequently, um, you'll hear the response that it was a song they heard or a poem they read or some little verse that came to them from their childhood that triggered a whole vision. In many ways, uh, poetry is indeed the language of the soul. It has been said that there are many ways of exploring reality, the first being the eye of the flesh, these eyes, these ears, the sensory apparatus through which we explore the world of material reality. If I want to know, are there craters on the moon? Are there rocks on Mars? Then I use the eyes of the flesh and the prostheses of the eyes of the flesh, which are the extensions, my scientific instruments. But there's a deeper way of, of exploring reality. And that's through the eyes of the mind. If I want to know what's the theorem of Pythagoras, what does it mean? I have to know the principles of Euclidean geometry in my mind. I have to understand Euclidean geometry. If I want to know 
have a godless principle or want to know anything in the realm of a deeper level of reality, want to understand quantum physics, I have to use the eyes of the mind, I have to participate, as it were, in the thought experiments of Einstein and his colleagues. And then there is a deeper level of exploring, it's through the eyes of the soul. It's through the eyes of the soul, a deeper level. So William Blake, who's a favorite poet of, I know, Wayne, said, we are led to believe a lie when we see with the eye that was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light. So poetry in many ways is illumination. It is insight, inner vision. It is epiphany. And at the same time, it is the inspired expression of that illumination. Definitely, poetry is the eye of the soul. If you want to trigger what I'm learning to understand as the sacred response, just read a great poem. And you'll see that it will almost act as a little button in that holographic template inside you, which has all the knowing of everything that has ever existed in the universe. So that whilst it's great inspiration, the word inspiration literally means to be in spirit, inspiration. And incidentally, the word enthusiasm to be, means to be in touch with God, on theos, to be one with God. Whilst it's great inspiration to read the poems and listen to the poems of these great people that Wayne mentioned, every single one of them exists right this moment inside each one of us in this room. I'll go into the science of that in a moment. Growing up, I was brought up literally with the poetry of Rumi and the poetry of Tagore. Many, many years later, of course, I was exposed to Shakespeare and Coleridge and E. E. Cummings and Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost and Perrault and Emerson and all the great people that Wayne spoke of. But I remember reading a long, long time ago something that Rumi said. Rumi, this 13th century Sufi mystic, he said, the most important thing you can have in your life is passion. And he said, you have to learn to become a passionate lover of life. He said, if you can be a passionate lover of life, then you will be a lover in death, you will be a lover in the tomb, you will be a lover on the day of resurrection, you will be a lover in paradise, and you will be a lover forever. And if you have not learned how to be a passionate lover, then don't count your life as having been lived. On the day of reckoning, it will not be counted. Another time he said, I am so mad with love that madmen have to stop me and say, be still. So I have felt a deep debt of gratitude to this great poet Rumi and from what I read, Rumi wrote 12 poems every day for the last 12 years of his life. And all of his love poems were written to God. All of this beautiful love music that you hear is written to God. This thing that Deepak has put together called Deepak and Friends, A Gift of Love, he won't talk about it, he won't do commercials, but I think it is so profound and so beautiful and it's just come out today. And some of those people, the voices that you heard, include Coleman Barks and, um, well, Goldie Hawn and Madonna, you may have recognized, and Demi Moore and Rosa Parks and Martin Sheen, Deborah Winger, and others. It's a beautiful, beautiful collection. There's two CDs and a little book in there, and it's available. 
And that's all I want to say about that. It's, uh, it's really worth your listening to. I sh- yeah. Let's go on just one more minute about Rumi, because Rumi has sort of come into both of our lives in the last few years. Uh, and I think not just our lives, but the whole world seems to have a recognition of Rumi. It's almost like there's an awakening of Rumi's work. Here's the selection that I chose for the wisdom of the ages. I love this. I saw grief drinking a cup of sorrow and called out, It tastes sweet, does it not? You've caught me, grief answered, and you've ruined my business. How can I sell sorrow when you know it's a blessing? You know, you think about Deepak, a man sitting back there, what, the thir- what 13th century, 12, uh, 1270s, 1280s? 1206. Middle Ages. Yeah. Having an awareness that, you know, I mean, today we have grief workshops. And we think that there are stages that you have to go through and that it's a horrible thing and that grieving is something that we have to all struggle for. And here's this mystical, whirling dervish of a, of a, of a spiritual a teacher saying, it tastes sweet, does it not? Let everything that comes our way has something powerful and wonderful to teach us. And it seems like, I remember when I was doing this research, Shelley said that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. You know, when you think of leaders, I'm I'm always amused, especially during politics. I'm out here listening to every other minute there's somebody running for governor on on your, uh, you know, out here in California and uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars and all talking about wanting to be your leader. And I'm always amused when I hear these people talking about themselves as if they are our leaders. Like... um, who are the leaders of the Renaissance? Who do you think the leaders of the Renaissance were? I mean, were they the governors and the and the and the politicians and the elected officials, or the you know, the leaders of the Renaissance were the artists and the musicians, the writers. And when you listen to these people who put it out there so profoundly and have been doing it for centuries. They're the ones who literally influence the most, don't you think? Absolutely. Now, I was recently in Ireland, and there's a mountain there which the Celtic traditions regard as sacred. And if you meet the warlocks and the wizards in that part of Ireland, they say, if you go up that mountain at night under a starry sky, be careful. And I asked them why. They said, because either you'll die, or you'll find God, or you'll become a poet. (laughs) And I don't know if you know the story about Rumi. On one occasion, he was so ecstatic that he started whirling. And he whirled and he whirled for 48 hours, some say more, and he uttered 6,000 poems as he whirled in one session. 6,000 poems. And all the scribes of the university, they had their notebooks and they were writing as fast as they could because they couldn't keep pace with him. And someone asked him, what's your secret? And he said, I have tried caution. I have tried forethought. From now on, I will make myself mad. There's total surrender. And I want to talk a little bit about where this all comes from, where this comes from for any one of us. Because as I said earlier, and you know, Wayne was talking about us being in Greece and we are inhaling the same molecules and the same atoms. And of course, we are the same, as Emily Dickinson would say, the same recycled dust that uh, is going in and out, and this brain is made up of the same carbon and hydrogen and oxygen that went into the brain of Pythagoras or Christ, and right this moment, uh, quantum physics would have us believe that right this moment you have in your body 
at least a million atoms that were once in the body of Christ or Moses or Socrates or any of the great poets that were mentioned earlier. But the fact is that as we go deep into this realm that is called soul, which is beyond both body and mind, we discover a realm of awareness that is actually very real and at the same time very mysterious. I was brought up with the Vedantic tradition which says there are, there are at least three components to any experience. The first is an experiencer, the second is the process of experiencing, and the third is that which is experienced. We might say knower, process of knowing, and the object of knowledge. Or you could say the seer, the process of seeing, and the scenery. So the body and everything that the body experiences out there is the scenery. It's the object of knowledge. The mind, the intellect, the ego, this is the process of seeing, the process of knowing, the process of observing. It all happens in the subtle body, the subtle realm that we call the mind, the intellect, and ego. But who is seeing? Who is knowing? Who is the observer in the midst of that observation? The observer in the midst of observation is the timeless factor in the midst of time-bound experience. And it's not difficult to find. Just now, as you're listening to me, just, just turn your attention to who's listening. Even as you're listening to me, turn your attention to who's listening. There's a presence there. And actually, if you become aware of this presence, you'll find something very interesting. It's a non-changing presence. The mind is changing, the emotions are changing, the body is changing, the scenery is changing. But this presence is non-changing. Even now, as you're listening to me, again, go back to who's listening. Was the same presence ten years ago? Was the same presence when you were a baby? The same presence tomorrow and when you're an old person? If you become intimate with this presence, if you befriend it, then you will recognize that this presence is beyond body and mind. It's the timeless factor in the midst of all this time-bound, changing experience. The experiencer is not contaminated by the experience. In fact, again, as you go back to the silent witness behind the scenes, you will recognize that there's a freshness to it. The mind gets burdened with emotions, the physical body gets fatigued with, with effort. But go back to this witness behind. It's fresh, as fresh as when you were a baby. Rumi says, you are that freshness, and I'm with you now. Nowhere again inside the majesty. Nowhere again, because Actually, as you peel the layers of the soul, you find first there's the mask of the ego, all our object referral, all the things, as Wayne said, we have accumulated, all the things that we identify with. But then you go beyond that, and there are our personal memories, all the experiences we've had as our child, in our childhood, maybe in other lifetimes, the personal domain of awareness, the software, if you will, of memories and desires and karma which we call the soul, but then you peel that, you go beyond that, and there are memories of the race, there are memories of the species, and go beyond that, there's the memory of all other species, all other beings, and then you go beyond that, and there's the memory of the creator, of the source of creation. 
this body mind and this soul, which is the software behind the body mind, is the holographic representation of everything that has ever existed. And I'm not speaking right now metaphorically, I'm speaking literally. Yatha pinde tatha brahmande in Sanskrit, as is the atom, so is the universe. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. As is the human body, so is the cosmic body. As is the human mind, so is the cosmic mind. And today scientists are talking about this non-local conscious energy field which is self-organizing that orchestrates literally everything that's happening in the universe. And so the steps to this are not that complicated. And before we start asking each other questions, or you can ask questions, just want to tell you what these steps are. The steps are first silence. Because as long as there's turbulence in the internal dialogue, we'll never get in touch with the soul. The soul is beyond that. Silence, meditation. Second step, surrender. Surrender simply means that I have lost my need to wish that things were not as they are. This moment as, is as is because the whole universe is as is. If I fight against this moment, I have to struggle against the whole universe. Surrender means that I let go of my idea of how things should be. If things don't seem to go my way, I let go of my idea of how they should be, trusting that I don't know the big picture. But if I knew it, it's fine. Surrender means no need to control, no need to manipulate, no need to cajole or convince or demand or beg or insist or seduce. It means to allow. And from surrender comes being. Being. We are, as I think Wayne's used this expression many times. And sometimes, you know, we are so much together, I don't know if I'm speaking or he's speaking. <laughs> and actually, then I realize it doesn't really matter. It's the <laughs> same being anyway. Same molecule. Same <laughs> molecule. <laughs> so from surrender, being. Being means that when I surrender in the silence, I realize that I'm not a human thinking. I'm not a human doing. I'm a human being. And then when I'm just being, the core of my being, the ultimate ground of my being is also the ultimate ground of every other being. That when I'm just being, then I'm in touch with the principle that is responsible for all the activity in this body-mind. But believe it or not, as I get in intimate with that principle, I recognize that it's the same principle that is responsible for all the activity in the whole universe. Same being. Same being. And from that state of being comes vision. What it means to be a seer. A poet is a seer. And the inspired articulation of that seeing. It is to go beyond bits of sensory experience. With bits of sensory experience, we can never see. We can only perceive. We are led to believe a lie, which we are. That was born in a night, to perish in a night. Seeing means to see the totality, to understand that with bits of sensory experience, I can never understand the whole. But when I dive into my soul and go into the spirit, I do see and experience the whole. And in that wholeness, which is healing, you know, the word healing, the word holy, the word wholeness, they all come from the same root. In that healing and in that wholeness, I recognize that my intent is actually the intent of God, of the universe. That in that seeing, I recognize that even my little intent is so powerful that the whole universe begins to orchestrate its fulfillment. Intent, and in that intent, if I ask a question, that's what intuition is. In that 
vision of being, if I ask a question, you know, you've heard the expression, ask and it shall be revealed, knock and the door will open, seek and you will find, just to ask a question, that's the intuitive response. And from that intent comes action which is spontaneous and effortless, what is called spontaneous right action. Not action in anticipation of somebody's response, but the right thing at the right moment, the intuitive response effortlessly orchestrated because it is the intent of the cosmic mind that is going through you. And then that action, which Vedanta says is without karma, it's not bound by karma, there's the fruit of action. And when you experience the fruit, you know that it is not your fruit, that it came from somewhere, and you have it for a little while, and you go, and you're totally detached from the outcome of that. And just to recapitulate, silence, surrender, being, seeing, intent, action, and fruit in that order. We usually go about it in the reverse direction. I'll do this, then I'll have this, and then I will be happy. Vedanta says, reverse the whole thing. Just be in bliss right now. And then you will automatically go through the sequence of intent, and your own intent will have the infinite organizing power of the cosmic mind. And even when you have the fruit, you will know that it is the fruit of that cosmic mind. In this vision, it is in this vision that Tagore, the other great poet that I was going to quote today, Tagore says, the same stream of life that runs through my veins, runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measure. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death, in ebb and in flow. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth into numerous blades of grass and tumultuous waves of flowers. He says, my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. Right this moment, the life throb of ages is dancing in our blood. And all we have to do is to surrender to it. And in that surrender, to not even want to take the credit for it. Just as I was just coming here um, this evening, I, I happened to look at some of my old notes and I came across this uh, very simple, very simple thing from the great Ramakrishna, who is an Indian seer, an Indian poet, and this is what he says. And don't mind my beautiful glasses. He says, the great Indian saint Sri Ramakrishna declared of himself, I am the machine and you, O oh Lord, are the operator. I am the house, and you, O oh Lord, are the indweller. I am the chariot, and you, O oh Lord, are the driver. I move as you move me. I speak as you make me speak. This is a description of spiritual union, which is definitely more than just an elevated feeling. This is a description of the ultimate truth at the heart of creation. The ultimate truth of the heart of creation is that the seer and the scenery and the process of seeing, the knower, the object of knowledge, and the process of knowing are all the same being in different disguises. We're all the same being in different disguises. And this ultimate truth is what love is. Love is not just a mere sentiment. Love is not just a mere emotion. Love is the experience of unity consciousness. And in unity consciousness, there is no time. There is only the eternal. So I'd like to close my little participation this evening by again going back to Rumi. He said, come out of the circle of time into the circle of love. 
I remember thinking when I first was exposed to Vedanta and the witness and, and Nisargadatta Maharaj and this whole idea of uh, uh, you do not suffer, he said to a woman who had cancer. And she was just appalled that he would say this to her, this great teacher in India. Uh, and she said, how can you say that you don't su I don't suffer? I have cancer and uh, I'm not expected to live. And he said something, uh, only the person you imagine yourself to be is suffering. You do not suffer. And then she got very upset with him and, and said, you mean to tell me, you know, she went right to the ego, you mean to tell me that, uh, that you don't suffer, that you don't get upset, that what's going on in your country and all of the poverty and all of the, the problems you're having with your neighbors and so on, this was back in the 70s. And, and he said, ma'am, he said, in my world, nothing ever goes wrong. And he was speaking, don't you think, Deepak, from a, uh, a perspective of, of being not a human being having a spiritual experience, but from being a spiritual being having a human experience. And when I went past the addictions of my life, I began to recognize that the craver, the craving, and that which is craved are all in the world of ego. They're all over here in this physical, material world. But when I was able to move to the witness, when I was able to somehow step out of and look at the craver, which was this body, the craving, which were the thoughts, and that which was craved, which was ever, whatever it is that I said I had to have in order to fulfill um, this, this craving that I was having, these three things were all something that I could observe. And as I began to observe them, and you, when you get to the observer, I think the observer is, is as close to something called unconditional love. I mean, that's at least what I got from Nisargadatta. Well, w there's one very poignant uh, dialogue when a disciple looks at Nisargadatta Maharaj and he says, you know, it's all very well. I see an old man sitting in front of me talking about all this stuff. You have a body. You have an ego. You're here. And Nisargadatta Maharaj says, yeah, there's a body, there's an ego, and there's a mind working here, but there are other bodies, and there are other egos, and other minds, and they're all equally mind. Mm. They're all equally mind. This is speaking from the state of unity consciousness. And you know, it's on one hand it sounds like clever language, but on the other hand it is the actual experience. You know, the Buddhists say, they say, what's the secret to enlightenment? And they say, uh, nothing, nothing whatsoever should be clung to as me or mine. That's the secret. Nothing should be clung to as me or mine. And you'll get there right away. I that's, went ego. To that's ego. That's ego. Always. Me and mine are ego. That's yeah, and so thing. I went to Maharshi a few years ago, when you don't know I used to be a mm -hmm. lot with him. I said, Maharshi, the Buddha say that nothing should be clung to as me or mine. He said, or everything should be clung to as me yours. and mine. Right. And you get to the same place. Right. Because if I, I said nothing is me or mine, then obviously everything is me or mine. Mm. It's when you are no thing, then you are spirit. I'm nowhere again inside the majesty uh, of Rabindranath Tagore. I just want to make one more comment, if I may, about sure. your point you made about addiction. Mm. Because you know, if I asked in this room, I said, how many people have had um, a problem with addiction sometime in their lives? I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol and cigarettes, but you know, work addiction, sex addiction, relationship addiction, codependency. So. Uh, I'll raise my hand. I have. How many others have had problems? Okay? So here, it's almost everyone. And you know that's an extremely good sign. Because addiction, if you really begin to understand what addiction is, it's a second class substitute for the search of ecstasy. Exult addiction is a sign that you want the exaltation of spirit. And if we have many addic addicts in our society, it means we're definitely moving in a spiritual direction. <laughs> no, seriously. 
Seriously, if you look at addict, you look at all the addiction programs, you'll find there are no psychological solutions to addiction. There are no motivational techniques for curing addictive behavior. If they work, they work for a little while. There are only spiritual solutions for addiction. If you experience the exaltation of your spirit, then you don't want any second-class substitutes. And you and don't put yourself down. Remember the, the, the quote of uh, the saint and the sinner? What did he say? That the, the he says, Maharaj says, the sinner and the saint are merely exchanging notes. Right. The sinner has, uh, has been a saint and sanctified. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, the sinner has, the, no, the saint has been a sinner, yeah. and the sinner shall be sanctified. And of course, Oscar Wilde said the only difference between a saint and a sinner is that the saint has a past and the sinner has a future. Right. So, and <laughs> when you totally get that, so what's the big deal? Carl Jung, who was uh, one of the most important um, uh, right, uh, psychologists, philosophers, rishis, I would say, of the century, he said ecstasy has three components, physical ecstasy, sensuous experience, this is a very sensuous universe, dolphins are dancing on the ocean and caverting on the ocean, children are playing, trees reach out to the sun, sun stars glitter at night, there are meadows and flowers blooming, Tagore in one of his poems says, where is that fountain that throws out these flowers in such a ceaseless outbreak of ecstasy. So there's this ecstasy on a physical level, then there's ecstasy on a mythical level. Deep inside us there are gods and goddesses, divine energies, archetypal energies that literally stoke the furnace of life in our souls. And many times when we do big things like big business merger or climbing Everest or flying a solar flight from uh, from America to across the Atlantic, or anything that is n out of the ed ordinary, we're actually partaking of the heroic journey as much as the Argonauts seeking the Golden Fleece, or Icarus flying toward the sun. So there's this mythical need inside us, the divine energies that say, get out of this ordinary world, get out of this mundane experience. There's a world of magic, there's a world of enchantment, there's a world of the devas, a celestial world which is vibrating on a different frequency. And then there's sacred ecstasy, which is the direct experience of God. And that ecstasy, exaltation, is our original primordial state in the Upanishads. In bliss these creatures are born, in bliss they are sustained, and to bliss they return. Or T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration at the end of our exploring, we arrive at the place that we started from and know the place for the first time. All these are descriptions of ecstasy. In the book from the Old Testament, actually not from the Old Testament, but in an Egyptian papyrus discovered recently, there's the experience of mythical and sensuous and divine or sacred ecstasy from Solomon, the prophet Solomon on the Old Testament. He's speaking to God and he's gotten rid of his addictions, and he says to God, he says, you split me and tore my heart open, and you filled me with love. You poured your spirit into mine. I knew you as I know myself. My eyes are radiant with your light. My ears delight in your music, and my nostrils are filled with your fragrance. You have made all things new. You have made all things magical. You have made me see all things shining. You have granted me perfect ease. I have become like paradise. That's what we are seeking for. Addiction is just a second class substitute. But it's good that at least we are seeking that. Well, uh, you know, there's a big difference, I think, Deepak, between um, knowing about something and knowing something. Knowing about something is a, is a belief system, and all of us in this room walked in here with, uh, with a set of beliefs. And, the le and these beliefs were handed to us by the tribe and by all of the people that we've uh, been exposed to in our lives. And, there's, and, and we have a tendency to just buy into all of this stuff, and we carry it around with us, and we're conditioned by it. And it becomes our, our, our way of reacting to things. But there's... In the world of the physical, like uh, 
there's nobody in here who knows how to swim who uh, learned it by watching somebody else or by having somebody else tell them that they could do it or by seeing movies of somebody else or whatever. You may believe that you could swim, but you know how to swim when you get in the water and, and blob about and, and, and finally uh, do it. And the same is true of virtually everything. Then we get into the metaphysical domain, into beyond the physical domain, and we try the same kinds of things that we have, you know, all these tribal beliefs or all these things the, that are based upon the experiences or the testimony of other people in our past, and we try to live that in the spiritual world. And so we get hung up, on, and I heard someone saying to me before about all the fears that I have, that if I do this, this isn't going to happen, or I'm going to end up being punished, or, or the, my tribe isn't going to like me, I'm going to, whatever it might be. There's a wonderful poem, it's not written by an ancient master, it's written by um, a woman who lives up in uh, Seattle. Listen to this, it's called the, the Cookie Thief. Some of you may have heard it, Valerie Cox. A woman was waiting at an airport one night, it was several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. But with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. <laughs> he offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. <laughs> Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. <laughs> and you know, Valerie Cox wrote that. Uh, we're, all, we're all cookie thieves. In some ways, we think that we know something, but the knowing that we have is really based upon what somebody else has told us or and we're not really open to a new experience. I've often told the story of my little girl, Sage, who's eight years old, who loves to take my keys in the morning and hide them. And then watch Daddy flip out, you know, <laughs> because I've got three kids to get to school and we've got 20 minutes to do it. And I'll say, Sage, honey, I've told you so many times, don't hide Daddy's keys. Now, I've told you, don't do that. He said, Daddy, I didn't do it. You told me I didn't. Come on, I know you hid my keys. Where did you put them this time? And as I get louder, my 12-year-old daughter will be standing there saying, I wonder what all those people would think of Mr. Positive right now. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> so I've got them coming at me in all ways. So finally, you know, because, you know, when you're a guru, <laughs> you practice, you know, mindfulness called mindfulness. And when you put something down, you always know where it is. You don't lose things when you reach this elevated state of consciousness that we're talking about here. And I place my keys always in the same place, and I make a note of them being there. So I go back in the back and I say, now Sage, get my keys. And I go back and I get my pants on and there are my keys in my back pocket. Right where I had left them the night before. 
cookie thief. And I've often said that there's a fine line between being a guru and being an asshole, all right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a line that I probably cross more frequently than I should be admitting here on tape, especially. But, you know, all kidding aside, this whole idea of coming to a knowing, I mean, we were talking about this at dinner last night, this idea of, um, uh, of knowing God. I mean, one of, the, one of the books that you handed me um, maybe 10 years ago and said, read this if you really want to know God. It's called How to Know God. And it's written by an ancient uh, seer. We don't even know the dates. Back in the 3rd century B.C., his name was Patanjali. And he wrote the original sutras, which teach us how to come to know God. But the essence of coming to know God, I mean, in, in India, they refer to these, these great spiritual teachers, whomever they are, whether it's Buddha or Christ or whomever, as uh, non-dual, non-dual beings. And I think of so much of the poetry that I read, they talk about silence. We talk about this all the time. Meditation, the power of meditation. In the opening of the book, the first two essays I wrote are about meditation. And one is a quote from Pythagoras, who was the oldest person in, the, in this collection. He lived in 580, he was born in 580 BC. And he said, and he was considered, he was a mathematician and a scientist, probably the greatest scientist of his time, influenced the thinking of Aristotle and Socrates and, and Plato and all the people that followed him. He said, learn to be silent. Let your quiet mind listen and absorb. And the other one was from Blaise Pascal, who lived 2,000 years later in the 17th century. And he said, and here, this is the man who, remember when you had to read, uh, study Pascal's law and the law of pressure and volume and all of this? He was the great scientific mind. He said, all of man's miseries stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So here we have two of the greatest scientists of antiquity and of the Renaissance period saying to us, if you want to understand your life, if you want to know God, you've got to go to the non-dual place, the place that cannot be further divided. And there is just absolutely no substitute for meditation. They teach it at the Chopra Center. I have put out a CD called Meditations for Manifesting, which is based upon uh, a, an ancient principle called Japa which is very simply the repetition of the sounds of the divine. Deepak and I have both visited a, a divine woman in, uh, who lives in Germany. Her name is Mother Mira. And being in her presence, I don't know how you would describe her, Deepak. Like she's like an avatar, would you say? Or? Silent. Yeah. <laughs> they say that enlightenment, there are two ways to achieve it for those who've walked among us. Some come here without ever incarnating into the ego state at all. They just are direct God, direct connections of God. And others go through the subduing of the ego, if you will. Well, Mother Mira, even as a young woman, she was born in 1960, was uh, seen in more than fl one place at the same time with this peaceful countenance and, and moved to Germany and uh, sits Darshan there. And my wife went there and I've been there and, and Deepak has been there. And to be in her presence is one of the most divine experiences you can have. And she says, on the, on the back of uh, this book of hers called Answers, she says, I suggest that you do your job and your duties wholeheartedly and joyfully and bring peace and happiness in your family and in your surroundings. Do japa, which is the chanting or repetition of the name of God. I use the sound of ah on my CD. And ask for whatever you want and you will receive it. So that when you talk about silence, Deepak, it isn't just meditating is something that we do to, to find peace in our lives. Meditating or, or, or is a way to transcend literally the, the physical duality of our lives, isn't it? Yeah, it's the place where the knower, the known, and the process of knowing become one. It's called samadhi. As you were thinking, uh, quoting all those beautiful sayings about silence, remembered what Franz Kafka once said. He said, you need not do anything. Remain sitting at your table and become quiet. Learn to become quiet, still, and solitary, 
and the world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Mm. The, the other thing that I'd like to just discuss is how many of these great masters that I studied put an emphasis on now, on being able to live in the present rather than having our minds so occupied with, uh, with the past or with the future. One of the great teachers in my life said, it makes no sense to worry about the things you have no control over because if you have no control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them. And then he said, it makes no sense to worry about the things that you do have control over because if you've got control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them. <laughs> And there goes everything that it's possible to worry about. You either have control or you don't. So worry becomes like this neurotic exercise of leaving the present moment. And it is said, in much of the literature that I've read, that when you are able to fully come into the now, that in meditation, that's when you'll come to know God. That is like you let go of all past and all future. And this, this idea of being in this, in this moment, in the present, is um, is like a theme that most of us haven't trained ourselves to do, to constantly see ourselves as uh, uh, connected to everyone, as here in this present, as not thinking about what's it going to be like tomorrow, as when we're having our cup of coffee, not thinking about what we're going to have for dessert, as when we're reading the opening lines in a in a paragraph not being concerned with what the conclusion is going to be, and so on. How many times have you found yourself reading and realized that you're not even there? You know, it happens on a regular, and you go back, you read three or four pages, and you say, I didn't get one bit of that. My mind was someplace else. Well, meditation, I think, is one way to really train yourself to, to be uh, immersed, if you will, isn't it, Deepa, in the now? Yeah, the fact is, the present moment is the only moment that never ends. It's the only <laughs> real moment. The past is in our imagination. The future is in our imagination. There is only the present. And there is only the ever-present witnessing awareness. When the past occurred, it occurred in that ever-present witnessing awareness. When the distant future happens, it will happen in that ever-present witnessing awareness. In fact, there is nothing other than the ever-present witnessing awareness. Even now, as we are sitting here, we are, of course, witnessing, but we are also being witnessed by the ever-present witnessing awareness. This space, for example, is that ever-present witnessing awareness. You can imagine the destruction of this room, the creation of this room, but try to imagine the creation or destruction of this, room, of this space that we are in. And the space is the reality, the room, the other walls and uh, the ceiling, this, these are the boundaries that we have given or shaped this. So ever-present witnessing awareness is actually the spirit. And the Vedic expression is, have your attention on what is and you'll feel the presence of God. Have your attention on what is and you'll feel the presence of God. So if you can't find God in this flower, you're not going to find God in a book of theology. And if you have your attention on this flower right now, with your totality of your awareness, you'll see the flower, but you'll also see rainbows and sunshine and earth and water and wind and space and the void of space and the history of creation in this flower. And if you go beyond that, you'll see that actually there's spirit, there's God in this flower. And if you can't find God here, then God is not going to be found by studying theology. You know, one of the reasons we can't find God in the flowers is because we're so often uh, preoccupied with labeling it. You know, what is, you know, you see God into the woods and you look at a flower, you say, what is this flower? What's it called? And you say, instead of looking at it and enjoying it and perceiving and being with it, we want to figure out what uh, category it belongs to and what's the name and what's the label and, uh, and so on. And, you know, Krishnamurti often said that when you go out into the woods, you know, forget about the labels. Forget about what things are called and just be there with them. But there's two poems that, uh, that talk about the now. Who put, they put it poetically. One is Omar Khayyam. 
back in the 11th century, the moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Once it's done, it's gone. But our minds have been trained, and one of the reasons we can't know that ecstasy of the present moment is because we have not trained ourselves in silence. One of the clever poets that I included, one of the modern poets who died in 1967, her name was Dorothy Parker. She called it on being a woman. She was a very clever lady. When she was informed that President Harding died, she said, how could they tell? So <laughs> 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 and she was supposed to have said of Katharine Hepburn's performance in a, uh, a movie in 1934, she had all the range of emotion from A to B. So uh, she was a biting, sarcastic kind of fool. But here's what she said about the now. She said, why is it when I'm in Rome, I'd give an eye to be at home? But when on native earth I be, my soul is sick for Italy. And why with you, my love, my lord, am I spectacularly bored? Yet do you up and leave me then, I scream to have you back again. <laughs> And so many of us, I think, don't really know the, the way to the now. And I think meditation or being quiet or being peaceful is, is one of those ways. And if you don't practice meditation, whatever technique you use, whether it's a primordial sound, whether it's uh, japa, uh, or whether it's just sitting quietly alone in a room, I think probably the most important thing that I could say to you is that I couldn't imagine my life with meditation. 15 years ago or so. And today I couldn't imagine my life without it. I couldn't imagine sitting down to write without meditating first, without asking for guidance and getting quiet and surrendering. And many people who have looked at my work over the past 25 years or so have said, you know, there's been such a shift. I've seen when you were writing erroneous owns and pulling your own strings in those books that that you were talking about something that's very different today. What happened? Someone asked me that question here today. What happened? And I, you know, you talked about Carl Jung, and Carl Jung uh, wrote a book back in the 50s called Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And in there he said there are basically four archetypes that we go through in our adult life. And I have been going through them. And I've been writing from my heart and speaking from my heart all of these years. And those archetypes are, he said, the first as an adult. I mean, we think of development generally. We think of children going through developmental stages. They go from infancy to, uh, you know, all the way up to adolescence and, 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 and toddler stages and so on. And then we think you get to adulthood and you sort of arrive. But Jung said as adults, we also go through stages. He said the lowest stage is the stage of the athlete which is the archetype of the time in our adult life when our primary emphasis is on our body and what it can do and what it looks like and how strong it is and how beautiful it is and how much better it is than everybody else's. He said then the second is called the archetype of the warrior, which is the time in our adult life when we take our physical bodies out and we go out to do things. What do warriors do? They conquer, they defeat, they get into competition with, they set goals for themselves, they see how much they can acquire. And so as warriors, we find ourselves uh, thinking about our own quotas. What's in it for me? How much can I get? And my earliest books were written from the perspective, I believe, of an athlete and a warrior to those teaching people how to be better warriors, how to be able to deal psychologically with your warrior status. But he said then we move to another stage, which is a stage that he called the stage of the statesman. And this is the time when we stop asking in our adult life, what's in it for me? What are my quotas? How much can I get? And we begin to say, what are your quotas? How may I serve? Becomes a much more important question to ask than what's in it for me. I remember being in Phoenix, and I've told this story before. Of, uh, Mother Teresa had been in the room the day before, and she had been interviewed there in Phoenix at KTAR radio station my friend Pat McMahon, the morning host there. And Pat said to her, he was so in awe that she had come there, and she had just come to talk about a homeless shelter. And he said, Mother Teresa, is there anything that I can do for you? And she said, no, Pat, but thank you very much. I'm here to talk about the homeless shelter. 
And he said, but Mother Teresa, he said, we have a very powerful radio station here. He went right to the ego. He said, we have 50,000 watts, clear channel. We could generate an enormous amount of publicity for your cause in Calcutta. And she said, but I'm not here for publicity. I'm just here to talk about the homeless shelter. I was invited. And he said, but Mother Teresa, please, he said, we could raise a lot of money. Couldn't I please do that for you? And she said, no, I'm really not interested in raising money, but thank you very much. And finally, Pat almost got down on his knees and was begging. Mother Teresa, isn't there anything that I can do for you? And she said, you seem so serious. She said, there is one thing that you can do, Pat. She said, tomorrow morning, get up at 4 a.m. and go out onto the streets of Phoenix and find someone who's living there who believes that he's alone and convince him that he's not. That's what you can do. Because those of us who are lost, the homeless, those who are feeling abandoned, the ill, basically believe that they're alone. They've lost their connection to spirit. There's a spiritual solution to every problem. We have a spiritual deficit in our society, a society that allows the kinds of things to take place represents a deficit of spirit, not the right laws or the wrong laws. We have to shift our spiritual awareness and come out of our warrior stage, and come out of our athlete stage and become statesmen. And finally, Jung said, the highest stage you can get to is called the stage of the spirit, where you begin to realize that this is not your home. What it says in the New Testament, that uh, you, know, you are in this world but you are not of this world, becomes your reality. And my writing over the past quarter of a century has just reflected my traversing through these paths and the people that I have met along the way, the people that have become my best friends, like the man I share the stage with today, have all come not because I have any special gift, but because I have shifted away from my primary emphasis being on my ego, what's in it for me, how much I can get. And I've begun to talk more about spirituality, higher consciousness. And as they say in Zen, when the student is ready, the teachers appear. And we're all teachers to each other. So it's moving to those higher and higher and higher states. And if you look at your own life, you can ask yourself that question. Have I evolved from a athlete who thinks that who I am is just this body and how beautiful and how strong it is? Have I evolved past what's in it for me and how much can I get? Have I evolved even past how may I serve into a spiritual awareness in which we recognize our connectedness to each and every one of ourselves? I had mentioned earlier, I was trying to find this poem by John Donne, and of course it came at the right time. It wasn't to be an hour ago, it is for now. And his meditation, number 17, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. He says, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We are all connected. No tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Deepak? In the Vedic tradition, the same evolution of consciousness goes from deep sleep to dreams to waking state of consciousness to glimpsing the soul to what is called cosmic consciousness, which is that state which Wayne referred to as being in this world and not of it, the alert witnessing of all the roles we play, and then from cosmic consciousness to God consciousness, where even the objects of our perception are literally even physiologically perceived in their local value, but also in their universal value, and then beyond God consciousness into unity consciousness, where the spirit here 
becomes one with the spirit here and then the whole universe is experienced in our own being. Rumi's poem about unity of consciousness where he says, let the waters settle, let the waters settle, you will see stars and moon mirrored in your own being. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We were fighting over who goes first there. We do it from the most enlightened to the least enlightened, so I'll start the. <laughs> or we do it from the oldest to the. I turned this mic off so there won't be any. <laughs> it's not going to work, Dave Parkin. I defer to age. <laughs> Except I'm ageless, you know. I read this book about an ageless body, timeless. The theme of this presentation is uh, how to change the world. We're going to address issues that confront us as a people. And you know that there are changes taking place on the planet. In the New Dimensions radio which some of you may listen to, which Deepak and I have both been interviewed with Michael Toms, they have a theme, and their theme says, it is only through a change in consciousness that the world will be transformed. And basically, we are not saying that you can go out there and just tomorrow morning make everything different. On the other hand, when we understand individual and collective awareness and how it impacts on the planet, you can see the changes taking place and they're not as subtle. You can imagine if uh, we'd have stood up here 15 years ago when both of us were doing public speaking and said that um, in a few years there will be no Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall will come tumbling down. A black man who has been imprisoned in South Africa will be released, and he will become the democratically elected president, and they'll do it with a minimum of violence and no warfare. A poet who is imprisoned in Prague for having ideas very similar to what we talk about here freely will be released with relatively little violence, and he will become the democratically elected president of that former dictatorship, Václav Havel. And he will address a joint session of, of uh, Congress and the United Nations on what we can do as poets to make the world a better place. Imagine in that talk if we'd have said there's a labor leader in Poland who, will, who is just simply a man who works on the docks, and he will be released, and he will become the democratically elected president of perhaps the most totalitarian state in the world like Beleza in Poland. And a woman in Nicaragua, a housewife, Violeta Chamura, will take on the Sandinistas and will do something to overcome the, the communist dictatorships in Central America. And in the Philippines, dictatorships will be eliminated by a woman who decides to run. These changes that are taking place on the planet represent a change in consciousness. And they've come about because of the consciousness that is in this room today. I think perhaps the most dramatic example of change that has taken place was when I was on a flight from Denver out to uh, someplace in Montana a few months ago. And a man came through the uh, cabin 
where I was sitting and asked me if I would like some coffee or tea. And a woman's voice came on over the PA as the pilot saying what our altitude would be and where we'd be flying to. Could you imagine that 10 or 15 years ago? A man serving tea and a woman flying the plane. Yeah. The changes have been subtle, and yet they're also very pronounced if you let go of some of our jaded perspectives and don't listen exclusively to what the media is trying to tell us, that race relations are at an all-time low and that the violence is at an all-time high, that um, you know, the world is all going to hell, and so on. Now, this is not to overlook some of the major difficulties and problems that we face as a people on this planet. But on the other hand, for every act of violence, in the world. There are a million acts of kindness. And keeping our attention on what we want rather than on what we don't want is a big part of the message, not only that I presented last night, a big part of the message that Deepak and I have put together on the tape we were talking about. And it's a big part of what all of us have to really deal with uh, in, in terms of not letting ourselves become uh, victims of we can't do anything, the world is getting worse. I would suggest that race relations in this country are uh, better than they've ever been. Certainly we have a ways to go. I can remember when I was in the Navy in 1958, my best friend was uh, a black from uh, Chicago. He was 17 and I was 17. Rayford Dudley, one of my best friends. And we were in Maryland, and we walked into a uh, restaurant, and they wouldn't serve us. He was in his uniform of the Navy, and he couldn't eat in a restaurant, a man who was representing his country. Those kinds of things are unheard of today, even though we have a long ways to go. And you'll see people intermarrying. You see people working together of all races and all persuasions, uh, and it's not even getting a second glance any longer. And the idea of not being able to stay in a certain hotel or to eat in a certain restaurant because of our ethnic background or what color our skin might be is becoming something that uh, we don't even think about much any longer, even though there is a lot of work to do. So changing the world is something that we are doing. It's happening. And yet, you look at the headlines and you see these troubling, troubling things. You see a young boy of 14 picking up a gun and wiping out his parents and then opening fire on his classmates. And we see that happening eight times in the last six months in our country. And we realize that it's, uh, it's becoming something that we have to address. I think, I have my own view on it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I remember in the 1992 election, when Clinton was running against George Bush, and he had a sign that said, it's the economy, stupid. Remember? It's the economy, stupid. When they asked me the other morning on a talk show, what do you think the problem is? I said, it's the guns, stupid. <laughs> it's the guns. We have become a country that has 200 million handguns, one for every person over the age of four, and an industry that is promoting death. And we have to look at that, despite what some of our more basic instincts might tell us. We have to look hard at that. Are we going to be a nation where everyone has a gun, or where no one has a gun. We seem to be having to go in one direction or the other. So rather than give a long talk about it, I'm going to read this poem by a man named Stephen Crane, who wrote The Red Badge of Courage. And I'm going to read a very short essay and look at some of the ideas in here and then ask Deepak to comment on it. The first subject that we'd like to cover, which is the subject of violence in our society, in ourselves, and what we can do about it individually and collectively. I think as a parent of eight children, and Deepak as a parent of two, 
that um, one of our major, major concerns is what kind of a world we are uh, creating for our children and their children to take over. And here's an ironic poem. It's irony. It's called War is Kind. And it's written by Stephen Crane, an American novelist who wrote The Red Badge of Courage. And here's what he says in his poem. Do not weep, maiden, for war is kind, because your lover threw wild hands toward the sky and the affrighted steed ran on alone. Do not weep, war is kind. Horse booming drums of the regiment, little souls who thirst for fight. These men were born to drill and die. The unexplained glory flies above them. Great is the battle god, great, and his kingdom a field where a thousand corpses lie. Do not weep, babe, for war is kind, because your father tumbled in the yellow trenches, ragged at his breast, gulped, and died. Do not weep, war is kind. Swift, blazing flag of the regiment, eagle with crest of red and gold, these men were born to drill and die. Point for them the virtue of slaughter. Make plain to them the excellence of killing in a field where a thousand corpses die. Mother whose heart hung humble as a button on the bright splendid shroud of your son, do not weep. War is kind. Obviously, it's great paradox in his poetry. And then let me read to you what that meant to me as I looked at the photo of Stephen Crane and read about him on that day when I was taking on this man and his poetry to write an essay. American novelist, short story writer, poet, and war correspondent, probably best known for the red badge of courage, Stephen Crane, who died at age 29, managed to produce work that assured him a permanent place in American literature. Stephen Crane was the youngest of 14 children lived a short but highly explosive life. He wrote about what simultaneously seemed to both attract and repel him. The violence of the streets and the victims it creates was the subject matter of his first novel, the story of Maggie, a girl of the streets, a sympathetic story of an innocent girl from the slums and her descent into prostitution and eventual suicide. In 1893, this topic was so taboo in literature that it was privately printed and Crane had to use a pseudonym this was followed in 1895 by the classic story of the horror of war, the Red Badge of Courage. He wrote of his aversion to violence, his sympathy for victims, and the downtrodden. Yet he was equally attracted to report and to experience firsthand these outrages, and once settled with a former brothel house proprietor. Stephen Crane's career as a writer and a journalist covering wars wherever they propped up on the planet was brief. He died at 29 of malarial fever and tuberculosis contracted while in Cuba covering the Spanish-American War. For me, I'm speaking of myself, for me, this poem of deep irony is not only a disparaging attack on war and all of its horror, but it stands as a classic statement against violence of any kind. Also included is the violence that we observe daily of man's inhumanity to man and the rage and fury within our own hearts. These are equally as destructive and are also the subject of the woman and child, of the poet's lament against war. His ironic poem, War is Kind, is a commentary on all of what he termed those little souls who thirst for fight, who find virtue in something so horrifying as slaughter, an excellence in a field of a thousand corpses. For me, this is a lesson to look within myself for any remnant of a little soul who might find glory in the trumpeting of man's inhumanity to man. It is a reminder to allow my big soul to triumph over its lesser compatriot and to suppress curiosity or fascination with violence of any kind. There are people who carry guns and leave maidens weeping all over the world, be it on battlefields or in our homes or schools and streets and playgrounds. All seem to be men who were born to drill and die, yet we do not believe that anyone has such a destiny at birth. This carnage is the result of our own curiosity and fascination with warfare and killing, with violence and rage, so that we attract into our collective lives the very thing we fear the most. 
we live in a more subtle fashion the same kind of life as the poet Stephen Crane, attracting to ourselves that which repels us. If we don't harness that little soul, we too will become victims of the search for the unexplained glory of the battle god and his kingdom where a thousand corpses lie. Our fascination with violence and its ultimate implementation, killing, is reflected in our preoccupation with action films wherein human life is reduced in value so much so that the taking of these lives is considered to be entertainment. Killing for the sake of keeping the customers happy takes its toll on our collective consciousness whether we recognize it or not. We defend the need and the right to carry handguns and they therefore become a high profit item in the world of commerce. A gun for every man, woman and child is now the goal of this industry and we're getting closer each day. Do not weep. War is kind. Yet there is much to weep about and there is no shortage of tears. Maidens howl in anguish every hour of every day as loved ones fall victim to our almost insatiable attraction to war and unnecessary violence. We live in the most violent society on earth where hundreds of thousands are killed and maimed yearly with barely a flicker of attention from our, quote, leaders chastising everyone on human rights. Recently, state officials from China were not to be granted full diplomatic recognition in an official visit because their country was being bitterly criticized for their stand on human rights. Bitter irony, indeed. This seemed to me not as ironic as Stephen Crane's poem, Do Not Weep, Maidens, for War is Kind. To make a huge dent in this kind of fascination with war, killing, and violence, we must first look within our own hearts and allow the big soul to triumph over those inclinations. We must find the place within ourselves where we know that in some non-earth-based way we are all connected by an invisible organizing intelligence and we need to live in this awareness. We must refuse to participate in any form of activity which purports to be entertainment, which trivializes violence and killing. We must teach our young sons that they were not born to drill and die, not born to throw their hands toward the sky in some kind of ego ritual of dying in battle as a badge of courage. We must raise them to have disdain for violence and to learn to check the impulses of fury brought on by an over-identification with ego's need to be triumphant in battle. We must teach them and ourselves the value of cooperation over competition and to understand the great wisdom in the Native American homily, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. We must elect those who see the horror in having a world filled with weapons and live ammunition. They have to pursue at all costs with true courage the end of all weapons that are designed to kill, be it from megadeth nuclear bombs to low caliber handguns. If they are meant to inflict death, we must find another way. And finally, we must look within our hearts to quell our little soul's attraction to violence and instead find our fascination with kindness and love. All we need do is be a little kinder toward each other. This was Aldous Huxley's answer when he was asked on his deathbed for his advice to mankind after a lifetime of study and exploration of the human spirit. Simple words with a simple solution. All we need do is be a little kinder toward each other. War is most assuredly not kind. Being kind is the solution not only in the world as a collective whole, but in our individual lives where it all began. To put this awareness of Stephen Crane's poem to work in your own life, begin to, one, eliminate your personal participation in movie-going, television-watching, or reading, which promotes violence or reduces the value of human life by making killing and maltreatment any form of entertainment. Two, teach young people to value kindness over killing. Talk to them about why you don't want them using play guns and weapons. Explain that they can change the world by choosing kindness over killing as a way to play. Three, catch yourself when you feel violent impulses and have a quiet talk which allows you to reprogram yourself along the lines of kindness rather than rage. By recognizing rage when it crops up, you will allow the big soul to begin to tame the more base tendencies of the little soul. And finally, support organizations which have as their mission the eradication of violence on our planet. There are many organizations from the UN to local groups who want to elect more kindness-oriented people to commissions and as government representatives. 
choose at least one to give your support to. That's it. This message, I very seldom read to an audience, but I wanted to put that out there exactly as I felt it after reading that poem. And it's exactly how I feel each time I see what we are doing in our society to promote and encourage violence as a form of entertainment. And some of the people that we look up to as heroes who play these roles in movies and television, when they're interviewed, very often they will say, well, they all know the difference between entertainment. But I don't think they all do. You see, when they asked me what the solution was to this thing that happened where the young boy picked up a gun and began to sh do the shooting, they said, is it because children are so frustrated now? I said, children have always been frustrated. My daughter, Tracy, who is here with us and lives in the Twin Cities, said, when I was 14, I would be so frustrated at you and at my mother. And I just, there were things that I just wanted to say, and I just, just was filled with rage, but I would just express it in some way, and I didn't have a weapon. This comedian that was just assassinated in his sleep, with two young children in the house, Bill Hartman, all of the analysis on television is about, well, it's marital difficulties, and we've got to learn how to be uh, closer to each other in our marriages. There's no cure for marital difficulties. Marriages have difficulties. In any relationship in which two people agree on everything, one of them's unnecessary. All right? We are never going to get rid of discord and disagreement and, and so on. But when we have the option in our home to have a loaded weapon there in the face of someone who perhaps is using drugs and perhaps not, but is at least filled with anguish and all they have to do is move their finger, we have to really look very hard at that. It isn't because there's marital discord. It isn't because children are upset. It isn't because of self-image. It's because we have created a society in which we have allowed guns and instruments of death to become something that is our way of life. And we can change that. We literally can change that. And when they tell me that, well, all we have to do is teach people how to be careful and how to be cautious, and then I read in the paper where a police chief in California, the chief of police, forgot that he put a gun in his oven. And he turned on the oven, and explosions started going off. Bullets started shooting out of the kitchen. This is the chief of police. If you have 200 million weapons, there are going to be children who find them. There are going to be accidents. There are going to be suicides. There we have to really look hard at what it is inside each and every one of us that recognizes and almost literally allows instruments of violence, not only on an individual basis, but on a collective basis as well. You know, Deepak is from a country in the world, from India, where there's an enormous amount of conflict today about what is going on with collective consciousness, the outrage that is being felt around the world at the need of more and more countries to explode nuclear devices. And it comes from the very same consciousness. And I think we can address that here, Deepak. I'd like to turn it over to you for a few moments and then we'll dialogue on it. Thanks, Wayne. During the Second World War, um, there was a great saint in India by the name of Sri Aurobindo. Perhaps you've heard of him. And somebody asked him <coughs> one day, you know, he had been in silence for uh, 
almost several months. He had not said a word. He had been in total silence and meditation for several months. And somebody asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm bringing the war to the end. I'm bringing this war to an end. And for most of us, uh, that would seem like a ridiculous statement. How is one man's silence, uh, profound though it may be, uh, bring uh, conflict resolution? Just remember that story because um, in the last maybe 10 years, there's a very good understanding of consciousness as a field. And what it is, is a field of forces that include electromagnetism, gravity, and subatomic forces uh, known as strong and weak interactions, which are basically subatomic forces. And scientists now recognize that actually they're all the same force. They refer to it as the unified field. So the electromagnetic field of the Earth is actually light. That's what it's made of. The usual colors of light, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, red, but also ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays and also infrared and microwaves and radio waves. That's the electromagnetic spectrum. And we are all beings of light, literally. And so is Mother Earth. And so is... The cosmos made out of light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Literally true. And what has been found is that when we look at anything that we consider material, for example this, wherever there's matter, there's energy. Wherever there's energy, there's information. Wherever there's information, there's intelligence. What is the difference between information and intelligence? When information becomes self-organized, it knows how to rebalance itself. It has a feedback loop. And that's not just information, it's intelligence. And wherever there's intelligence, there's mind. And it is mind, through its intentionality, that orchestrates the self-referral or self-organization of intelligence. And wherever there's mind, there is consciousness. So if you were to look at the hierarchy of levels of intensity of how consciousness expresses itself in the cosmos, would be matter fields, in, uh, energy fields, information fields, intelligence fields, mind fields, consciousness fields. Fields, because in a field, everything is inseparably connected with everything else. So that the human brain and the human body is actually one of the most powerful magnets, if you will, that exists. It's part of the Earth, which is a magnet as well. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. And in the intraneuronal arbors, the spaces between neurons, there's an electromagnetic field that actually is influenced by our intentionality. And that electromagnetic field then subsequently creates electrical impulses, which then transfer into matter, energy, etc. In other words, we are inseparably not only connected with each other at the level of consciousness, but we are actually connected with all of life, and we are collect connected with the electromagnetic fields of the planet and the cosmos, so that when there is turbulence inside us, when there's turbulence inside us, then that turbulence is not just confined to me. If there's turbulence inside me, it's not confined to me. It will affect you. And ultimately, it will affect the electromagnetic fields of the Earth as well. So if there's a big earthquake and there's frequency of earthquakes in a certain part of the world, if you understand this model, you can actually make a connection between what happens in human consciousness and what happens in the Earth's consciousness. The two are inseparable. We are part of the Earth. We are an expression of the Earth. We are recycled Earth. We are together. And there are, at quantum mechanical levels, 
no well-defined edges to us. We are part of, we are like ripples in the vast ocean of consciousness. And Vedanta says it is our duty to be peaceful because when we are not, we disrupt cosmic harmony. It is also our duty to be healthy because when we are not, we disrupt the state of well-being of the whole cosmos, not just each ourselves, but the whole cosmos. So just for the sake of of humanity and all living beings and all sentient beings, we need to find that place of perfect peace inside us. Many years ago when I was um, interested in the science of meditation even more than I am today, um, I was involved at looking at some studies uh, during the collective practice of meditation. So if all of us just now were meditating together and we had oscilloscopes hooked to our brain waves, oscilloscopes that are recording our brain waves, within a few minutes you would see that our brain waves would entrain, which means they would become coherent. If you were to look at an oscilloscope, we'd all be our brain waves would all be marching to the same step. We would be coherently in tune with each other. And entrainment is a normal phenomenon in nature. It begins, begins even at the time of conception and begins uh, through the experience of sound in the womb. Entrainment is a normal phenomenon even in inanimate forms. If you take a pendulum and you start swinging it and you, of, an, of a clock and you take si six clocks and all their pendulums are swinging to a different rhythm, but you just leave them alone in the same room for a little while. After about two or three hours, they'll all swing to the same rhythm. You've seen birds flying in the sky. They are perfectly entrained. They move in one formation. There's no time for the leader to tell the others, I'm going to make a left turn. They all kind of swing in the same rhythm. Or you've seen schools of fish moving as if they're one organism. Entrainment is very common even in... Uh, people who are intimate with each other. Actually, uh, there are studies that show that if a lot of women are living together in a confined environment, like a prison or a convent, which is a similar situation, then after a while, <laughs> after a while, their their uh, menstrual cycles in train. So our biological rhythms are constantly seeking naturally to align themselves with the rhythms of the cosmos. And when we are out of it, first of all, we get unhealthy. Secondly, we create a disruption in that inherent, coherent rhythmicity that orchestrates the whole cosmos, which is the nature of this conscious energy field from where everything comes. So when we were doing these studies at one point, you know, it is known that when you are in a st state of settled awareness or when you feel self-empowered in the true sense, power in the true sense means that you have no fear because hostility and rage and anger are all expressions of fear, really. And if India has blown the bomb, it's out of fear. If Pakistan is doing the same thing, it's out of fear. Rage, anger, all of that is an expression of fear. When we have complete absence of fear in our well-being is one of a settled state of awareness, then you feel powerful. You really feel powerful. Rage and anger is not a sign of power. It's a sign of weakness. And there is a biological correlate to this. Your serotonin level goes up in the brain, goes up in the body. Now, it's not easy to measure serotonin, but you can measure its metabolite in the urine. So you can look at serotonin levels by measuring its metabolite, which is called 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, or 5-HIAA, and it measures serotonin turnover. These days, lots of people are depressed. They're taking Prozac, which is supposed to increase your serotonin. You feel happier, you feel more contented, you feel more powerful. So a long time ago, we decided to, there was a course we were doing where there were approximately 7,000 people meditating together. We were looking at their brainwaves, 
and the brain waves would become coherent, then we would measure five hydroxyindole acetic acid levels in their urine, and they would go up, which to us wasn't surprising. We are coherently doing the same thing. We are creating a coherent conscious energy field, and so we are all, all feeling empowered, and uh, therefore the serotonin level should go up. That's not surprising. What was surprising is that when we measured the serotonin levels, we meaning the scientists that I was, I was, they were my colleagues, these scientists, and they were from the Transcendental Meditation Movement. When we measured the serotonin turnover on people who were not meditating, people on the street, guess what? Their serotonin levels went up. So what we were doing as a group not only influenced us, but influenced what was happening outside us, out there on the street. So Sri Aurobindo was not off the mark at all in experiencing his silence, that great saints in their very being, not by what they do, I agree, 100% with all the things that Wayne said we should do. We should. But ultimately, our very being should not allow violence. There's a sutra in Patanjali's work. Patanjali was a great seer who lived a couple of thousand years ago, a little before Christ. And he said, when we are firmly established in nonviolence, all beings around us cease to feel hostility. When we are firmly established in nonviolence, all beings around us cease to feel hostility. I have, in the past, taken extended periods of silence for a week. Uh, this is during my days with Maharishi. Only recently I've started to do that again. So every three months my office will arrange for me to go into silence for four or five days. But I remember, and every time I do that, it is very much of a process of renewal and regeneration. Silence means I don't uh, watch television, I don't listen to the radio, I don't communicate on the phone, I don't see fax messages, I don't even read, because when you're reading, you're communicating with the author. Uh, silence means no communication linguistically. So you can still the mind and commune. And the first time I did this for about 10 days, I did this in upstate New York. And this was uh, many years ago, in the 80s, actually early 80s, 81. And I remember we were doing it together. We were about a group of 10 or 15 people who were doing silence together, going into silence together. And one day we came out of our meditation room. We would eat in silence. We would walk in silence. We were up in the country. One day we came out, and there was a tree. And in the tree was a little hole, and there was a bird's nest. And there were lit these little birdlings that had just been hatched, and there were birds. And we went by it. And I just sat there, looked at these birds, and I felt such enormous connection with them. I just put out my hand there, and the bird hopped out of its nest onto my hand. And I was in shock. And two days later, in the depth of that silence, I was sitting after meditation, but still in silence, on a chair. And I decided, you know, I'm going to commune with these birds. So I would look at a certain bird, and I'd just say, in my mind, because I wasn't supposed to speak, I would say, come to me. I would just hover, fly, and it would come to me. And the reason was, <coughs> there was no melodrama, there was no hysteria. The Americans, or American Indians call this impeccability. The best use of your energy. No turbulence, not caught up in the melodrama and hysteria, to have that kind of impeccability allows you to commune where your intent assumes infinite organizing power. 
which means the whole universe orchestrates your intent because you are connected with the mind of the cosmos. That's what it means to be coherent. And when that reaches a kind of critical mass for a given population, it doesn't have to be a whole bunch, but one to two percent, it influences the entire population. So for just that reason, for the collective health of the planet, we should be all really going more and more into the experience of our spirit. And then things like this will not happen. India, unfortunately, has lost its spirituality. We tend to judge a civilization usually by its luminaries. And India had great luminaries. Mahatma Gandhi, the great seers, Patanjali, Ramakrishna, Krishna Murti, you name it, that the history is full of luminaries. But we can't allow that to give us a feeling of false pride or security. The Greeks had great luminaries, but we can't allow that to give Greek civilization take all the credit. These are human beings that belong to the world. Just because gravity was discovered in England by Isaac Newton doesn't make gravity English. And Krishna Murti was one of the first person to articulate that nationalism is a form of tribalism. It's just a form of tribalism. In the name of nationalism, we go to war, we wear uniforms, and we wear medals, and we kill. And we are made heroes. If we don't have the medal, we don't have the uniform, we call it murder, and we put people in prison for that. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And yet, in one case, you're honored and made a hero, and in another case, you're sent to prison for the rest of your life. There is now evidence that the schooling for criminal behavior begins even before children are born. And it happens in response to sounds of violence. Let's say you have a single mother who's under a lot of stress, and she's living in inner city Los Angeles, she has very poor income. She is surrounded by sounds of violence. There's gunshots and sirens and screams outside. And the baby in her associates those sounds with the adrenaline rush that comes from stress, from the mother's stress. And afterwards, even when it's born, it will trigger violence. You bang a door or a police alarm sounds, or the siren sounds, or somebody screams, or there's a gunshot, it will trigger violence. And you know, scientists even have a word for this. They call it free-floating hostility. They call it free-floating rage. For no reason. Because the child has been programmed for violence even before it's born. Now, the opposite of that is also true. In the Buddhist um, culture, they sing songs to a baby before it's born. In a certain African tribe, they name the baby even at the moment of conception. And then they sing its songs throughout its incubation in the uterus. And they make a special song for that baby. And then when the baby is born, the baby is welcomed into the world with that song. And afterwards, at every ceremony, every birthday, every ritual, Every initiation, adolescence, puberty, marriage, and finally on the day of death, that song is sung for that person. Whenever that person feels stressed, if they feel stressed at all, they don't go out and pull a gun. They don't take Prozac. They sing their song. They sing their song. So. We need to bring that back. We need to bring that back. Many years ago, I was involved in a study uh, indirectly with the, the founder of Sony Corporation in Japan. And we could show an ultrasound that if you played music and poetry to the unborn child, if the mother practiced meditation and yoga, if there was loving conversation between the husband and the wife, you could see on ultrasound the baby would respond with smiling. 
if you made an unpleasant no noise, the baby would put its hands to its ears. Mr. Buka died, but I never forgot this. And recently at the Chopra Center, we have now started a program called Magical Beginnings, Enchanted Lives. And what we do is we take, um, we, uh, this program is for pregnant mothers. We have actually made poems for the unborn child. We have, we have created poems and music for the unborn child. And um, the mothers collectively um, speak to their children, even before they're born, sing to their children, celebrate with their children. Um, they practice meditation, yoga, breathing techniques, proper nutrition. And when these babies were born in the Japanese study, they would respond to their name even at the moment of birth. They were so highly cognitive. Their perception was far more refined. They were intuitive. So that's what we can do. We've taken this Magical Beginnings program now to a couple of hospitals. We just recently are going to work on this program with Tufts University School of Medicine. and We're going to take it to the inner cities uh, and we're going to take it to the March of Dimes because I think it's our responsibility to create a generation of enlightened beings. And that's the only solution. Enlightenment is the only solution for violence. There are so many things to react to to what you're saying, Deepak, and you say it so beautifully. I remember being in Bali a few years ago, and we went into, we were back in the villages in the most rural parts of Bali in Indonesia, and we walked into the uh, village, and there was an old man with no clothes uh, sitting right at the gate of the village, where maybe three or four hundred people live. And he was just sitting there, and he was looking up into the sky. And I asked the man who was taking us there to, uh, who was touring my wife and I, what does he do? Oh, he said, uh, he's a cloud maker. I said, a what? He said, oh, he makes clouds. I said, does he really think, this was a few years ago when that was sort of a foreign concept to me, does he really think that he can make clouds? He said, he doesn't think he can make clouds. He makes clouds. He's a cloud maker. And whenever we have a shortage of rain or whenever we have uh, you know, a bit of a drought or whatever, he just goes out there and he just begins to put his attention on rain. And clouds come and that's what he's been doing. That's what he's been doing all of his life. I got back home and I'd be in my backyard. <laughs> and I thought this was so great that I was going to work on it. I was going to try it. And I remember laying down, and I take my kids out there. I said, they said, where are we going, Daddy? I said, oh, we're just, don't worry. And I, they were very little at that time, maybe uh, three, five, seven, nine. I mean, I have lots of them, that <laughs> all different ages. And we'd lay out there. My little girl would say, I'm making a giraffe. Look, I've got a giraffe. And then the other one would say, that's not your cloud. That's my cloud. And people would go by, and the neighbor would say, Look, who are all these dire kids? They all think that they're out there making clouds. <laughs> But we really had sort of a sense that uh, we were doing it. And, and when, I guess when you're raised on that, Deepak, when you're, I mean, I remember one of the things that when we first met, you, we were talking about if we could get 1%, just 1% of the people meditating on peace and on consciousness, that literally that could uh, create the critical mass that you were talking about. Absolutely right. But I think also we are in a time where scientifically, we can see this connection. You know, when you were speaking about the rain or the, the cloud, cloud maker, maker, I remember about 15 years ago there was an anthropologist uh, from Ireland. I forget his name right now, but uh, it'll come to me. Um, he was writing a book on a particular kind of whale, a particular species of whale. And his brother is um, the, the head of the zoo in London. And he wanted to get a picture of this whale. And this, apparently, this whale is found only in Indonesian waters. So he, you know, there are about a thousand islands around Indonesia. So he went to these little islands, uh, wanting to take a picture of this whale. And 
he didn't have much luck. And one day somebody said, there's a young girl here. Her name is Tia, and she can fetch the whale for you. So she's about 12 years old, and he goes to meet her. And she says, no problem, come to the beach tomorrow and we'll fetch the whale for you. So they sat on the beach, and she went into silence. And uh, this author, he says, about 15 minutes later, he was feeling very silly when he kind of peeked through his eyes and he saw a huge fin uh, on the horizon, a huge kind of splash. And his heart started thumping because it was the whale that he was looking for. And then it came nearer, and it came nearer, and it came nearer, and it beached itself. And they had to get the village people to come and take the whale back and uh, into the ocean. And he was nonplussed, he didn't know, and he was looking for the girl, and she had disappeared, you know, this little girl. And finally he found her, and he said, uh, what did you do, Tia? Mm -hmm. She said, I went to that place where we all speak the same language, and then I asked it to come, and it came. Mm -hmm. So that's the power, right. if you are at that level. Now, recently I was in, uh, in Indonesia, so I said, you know, I should test this out. Is this really <laughs> happening? And you know, I'm thinking about it, and I'm traveling on Garuda Airlines, and there's an advertisement for whale catchers and shark callers. Mm. For five dollars, you can get a guy to fetch the whale for you, mm. or the shark for you in certain parts of Indonesia. But you know, their, their mindset is different. They don't well, they're look not at raised this. on doubt. They don't have any doubt. About they don't it. have any doubt, but their mindset is also me and the whale I and this to. ocean. They're all part mm. of God's creation. What's that and great line from Rumi? Out beyond all ideas. Out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing. There's a field. I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there in that field. And that field is a field that all of us have. And yet one of the questions, I think, Deepak, that a lot of people say is, but what do I do if I'm surrounded by violence. You know, how do I get the field cleaned up? I and mean, that's a question I get often. I, and I remember, there's a, a story, I, it was told to me that it was a Buddha, but I don't know if it was, but it was of a great uh, saint uh, a long time ago. And someone had heard about this man who was living at this divine place called uh, Inner Peace. And all he had to give away was love. And he decided to confront the Buddha. And he was going to spend days in his company just being uh, nasty and uh, argumentative and, uh, and, and very cryptic and, uh, and saying con condemning kinds of things and antagonistic kinds of things. And everywhere he finally found the Buddha. And he spent three days criticizing and being angry and, and sending him all of his hatred and anger and violence. And after three days, the Buddha never responded with anything but love. And finally, the man couldn't stand it anymore. And he said to him, he said, I just don't understand. I have been criticizing you. I have been fi finding fault with you. I have been condemning you. I have been really very hostile towards you for three days. And all you come back with is love. How do you do that? And his response was, when someone offers you a gift and you don't accept that gift, to whom does the gift belong? And that was his response. So if someone offers you a gift of their hostility, but you refuse to take it, who owns it? Whose is it? And why would you allow yourself to become immobilized, depressed, or out of your peace because of something that belongs to someone else? And there's, I think there's a very powerful message for us, not only individually in our lives, I think, but collectively as well, how we can respond. What, what terrifies me, it doesn't terrify me, but what concerns me is India explodes a, a nuclear weapon, which France just did a few years ago down in the South Pacific. And then uh, instead of listening to St. Francis and his prayer, where, you know, where there is hatred, so love, uh, our, the response is, I'm going to match it. I'm going to be a part of what I don't want. It's almost like an addiction. We can never get enough of what we don't want. We just keep going after the thing that we despise the most. 
And then this morning on, on the television, they showed little children, 11 and 12 years old, in Islamabad in Pakistan, uh, all celebrating, jumping up and down because a nuclear weapon had been exploded. I think it's, it, it's true in virtually every area of our life. If enough of us, and I used to tell my clients this and my patients this when I was practicing as a therapist, that you have a responsibility to be happy and to be peaceful. Because if you're not, you could be depressing somebody in Bulgaria right now. <laughs> That's the connection. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, we look at the Holocaust and we say it was Hitler. But who's Hitler? He's a second-rate corporal with a very poor self-image, impotent to boot. And <laughs> he did it? Of course not. It was the collective madness of our world. It is the collective madness that surfaces in these so-called space-time events. And when we change, even one person changes, it affects the field, coherent, the coherence in that field. Even one person changes, it affects the coherence in the field. Mm -hmm. And you can measure it. That's the exciting part of it that you can actually show how consciousness behaves like a field. You know, you have a magnetic field or an electrical field, and you make a disturbance in one part of the field, the whole field is affected. Okay. The physicists say, when an electron vibrates, the universe shakes. And of course, Rupert Sheldrake in England has done some amazing studies on this. On the morphogenetic field. On the morphogenetic right. fields. I mean, the most interesting studies are how is the field orchestrating in any, you know, you think you and I are doing anything, it's all being done. It's being orchestrated by that cosmic mind. It is when we interfere with that, that, that we have problems. So uh, Rupert has done these studies right. on intention, and the most fascinating studies are with pigeons, you know. How does a pigeon find its place home? So if you bring a pigeon from... Uh, from England to Minneapolis, and you let it go in a few days, it will find its uh, way home to its little loft in, in England, in outside the city. Well, some scientists have even done studies now where they take pigeons, breed them in a ship, and you know, the, the pigeon is in a ship in Australia, you bring the ship with the pigeon to Minneapolis, wait till the ship is in Sweden, and uh, in a few days, the pigeon will find its way to its loft in its ship in Sweden. And that requires a lot of computing ability. But when that intent... What's going to happen when they start doing it in space? <laughs> <laughs> Four pigeons. <laughs> well, you know, that intent, the whole field orchestrates itself yeah. around the intention. How does a parrot learn to simulate human language? I have a friend in, Boston, in San Diego Every time I go to his house, his parrot uh, starts singing Beach Boy songs. And he even has a California accent. And, you know, I said, how big is the brain of a parrot? It's about one-third the size of my fingernail. It has rudimentary or absent vocal cords. It has a beak for a mouth, and it sings Beach Boy songs. <laughs> That's the power, intent in the field. You know, if we could understand that, we would understand the whole mechanism of synchronicity, which is just, first, change your worldview. Know that there is no separation. We are not separate. That's an artifact of our senses. It's a distortion of our sensory experience. There's only one inseparable wholeness. Change your worldview. Second, understand that more than anything else, the most important thing is relationship. In fact, there is nothing other than relationship. We are a set of relationships. My liver, my kidney, my heart, my brain, this all set of relationships. And if I look at these organs, they are relationships of cells. If I look at these cells, they are relationships of atoms. If I look at the atoms, they are relationships of subatomic particles. Go beyond that. It's the relationship of the conscious energy field to itself. We are beings, the same being in different disguises. And when we start to pay attention to relationship, I'm your equal, you're my equal. You know the Indian acknowledgement, namaste? It simply means I honor that place inside you which is equal to the place inside me. And just in the inner attitude of that, 
you connect with other souls. Start to find out the karmic significance of events. Start to participate in the cosmic dance. And you'll see, synchronicity happens all the time. In fact, our biology is synchronistic. The human body can sing thoughts and play a piano and kill germs and remove toxins and make a baby all at the same time. And while it's doing that, it tracks the movement of stars. That's synchronicity. If my body is synchronistic, if that flower is synchronistic, why can't my mind be synchronistic? Because I've got this thing I call the ego with its anxiety and its fears and its rage and its nuclear bombs and its guns. It comes all from ego, whether, it's, whether it is the ego of an individual or the ego of a nation. It's the same thing. Yeah. And it, I think another way of saying that is that it's what you can do, and that's what this, this is about, this dialogue, is rewrite your agreement with reality. Like you rewrite it. Because you've been programmed yourself to have an agreement that says who you are is what your tribe has dictated or what other people have told you are your limitations or what can and can't be done. And, I mean, we could talk forever about all the scientific validation of, uh, of synchronicity and, and how we're all connected. But it's only when you start practicing it. I mean, get outrageous. I mean, I go out in the backyard and tell my kids I'm going to make it rain. I, mean, I read a book by Valerie Hunt called The Infinite Mind where she talks about the, the capacity of our consciousness to literally change around all of our physiology and all of this, you know, the, the El Nino and all of the kinds of things that we put the blame on for all the things that are wrong. To literally, um, and all you can do is be wrong. Well, who isn't wrong? You're wrong all the time anyway. What's the difference? But if you, if you and if you don't share it with anyone else, because as I said before, when you... When you invoke ego, you can't manifest. You can't create the kind of world that you want because a, a summary of quantum physics is nothing more than particles themselves are not responsible for their own creation. It takes something more. It takes the infusion of that spirit. So you rewrite your agreement. I know, for me, I was, when, when this teacher of mine, Sri Guruji, who I dedicated my Manifest Your Destiny to, taught me this manifesting meditation, this japa, and said, if you can get 1% of the people of the United States doing this every single day, well, that just represents, you know, two and a half, three million people. I really know that I can get two and a half to three million people uh, doing that. It might take me 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, but I never give up on that. And, you know, and the man that I'm sharing this stage with was one of the people who got me involved in, in meditation when we first met. And... This, this whole idea of just going, getting quiet, going to that place within yourself and rewriting it. I have a wonderful little summary of uh, how we change our life. Some of you have heard this, I'm sure. It's called, uh, it's written by Portia Nelson. And she wrote a book ab about this, about the sidewalk, the hole in the sidewalk. And she said she was given a five by seven card at the end of a, uh, of a seminar such as this. She was asked to write down um, the five chapters of her life on a five-by-seven card so she don't get too wordy, all right? And she said, here are the five chapters of my life. And it's, this is really a, a wonderful summary of it. She said, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. And it takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter 2 of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. And it still takes me a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault, and I get out immediately. Chapter 4 of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. 
I walk down another street. <laughs> Isn't that great? And I think walking down another street is what we're talking about, not just individually, but collectively and as a people. You know, we have got to walk down another street. And how do you think Nelson Mandela, I've never asked you this, Deepa, how do you think Nelson Mandela got released from prison, when was it, in 1992 or 93, whatever? How did that happen? Do you have any idea? Well, how did the Berlin Wall come down? I was actually in Berlin the day it came down, and uh, the day before I had... Um, I had uh, had to use my passport to go to right, Checkpoint true. Charlie. Yeah. I lived in Berlin for thing. a year, I remember it well. And then the wall came down, and it wasn't there the next day. It was all happened in one day, and people were dancing on the streets and you know, drinking beer and celebrating, and I too went there, and um, there was no wall. There was just a big neon sign, and it had the picture of Karl Marx, mm. and underneath it, it said, Sorry, chaps, it was just an idea. Mm. Okay. <laughs> And, you know, suddenly crit critical mass said, <laughs> we don't need that idea right. anymore. And same thing with Nelson Mandela. There's a collective um, consciousness that says, you know, he's, he's uh, a saint, this man. And uh, we have imprisoned him for all these years on the basis of the amount of pigment in his skin. Mm. I mean, if anything... You have pigment deficiency, and I have a <laughs> lot more than you. All in how you look at it. <laughs> it's just like looking at a rose, you know. You can say, isn't that a... Too so, bad that a rose has thorns. And you can say, well, it's nice that thorns have roses. <laughs> I mean, it just uh, depends on how you look at it. <laughs> now, I think on the level of relationship, really, which is what it's all about, um, Vedanta Ayurveda says, um, relationship is a mirror. Those that we love, those that we are attracted to, and those that we are repelled by are mirrors of our own self. So anytime you're attracted to someone, you should ask yourself, what, what are the qualities this person has that I also have, but I want more? That's why I'm attracted. Mm. And if you're repelled by someone, you should ask yourself, what are the qualities that so enrage me in this behavior that I'm denying in myself? And if I just do that, then the relationship becomes the tool for the evolution of our consciousness. A couple of years ago, I want to give you this interesting story, and it's almost like a confession. Mm. But That's okay. I'm here. I'm here yeah, to take your confession. Yeah. Thank you. Father, Holy, Father Dyer. Holy here. Father. Yes. Uh, so I was at a course, a weekend course called Journey to the Boundless. And uh, after the first break, a young, not a young, well, yeah, very young woman came up to me. And she said, um, she said, um, I need three hours of your time for a personal consultation. <laughs> I said, this is a weekend course. There are about 500 people here. Uh, I don't think I can uh, give you three hours of your personal time. She said, but I came from Mexico. You've got to give me three hours of your time. And uh, you've got to do it really quickly. I said, did, did you call my office and mention this to them? She said, yes, I did. I said, what did they say? She said, they said it wasn't possible. So I said, then why are you asking me? She said, because in your book you say everything is possible. <laughs> so I get that all the time. <laughs> I, I said, um, I, I'm really sorry, but I don't think I can do that this weekend. And she put her hand like this on her hip and she said, you hypocrite, <laughs> you fraud, and a few other things which I won't say right now here. And, you know, I was supposed to give a lecture five minutes after that, which I did. But then I went to my room later, and I sat down in meditation, and I wrote down everything about her that really made me mad. <laughs> and it was, she was rude, she was hostile, she was confrontational, she was intimidating, she was nasty, and I made a list of about 25 things. <laughs> and then I picked up my phone, after, did a little more meditation before that. I picked up my phone, I called a person that I'm pretty close to in uh, Random House, my publisher, um, publicist, whom I work with on a daily basis. And I said, Patty, have you ever seen me rude and hostile and nasty and confrontational? 
There was silence on the other side. I called my wife and the silence was much longer. Now what happened is, in doing that exercise, I lost my need to judge this woman. And I lost that need to judge her completely. And I wasn't putting out any more of that energy. When I went back, she had changed. I suddenly saw, and I didn't do anything. It's not that I did anything with her, I didn't say anything. But her behavior to me changed. As a result of what I did in my room, her behavior to me outside the room changed. So, confront your shadows. If you are enraged right now, as I am, I'm definitely enraged at the fact that a country that I was born in, I don't really consider myself Indian anymore. I consider myself a universal being, and I do agree with Krishnamurti that nationalism of any sort is a sophisticated form of tribalism, and we want to get out of the tribal mind. But even so, I get upset when I think of the bomb. Really get upset. And this is an opportunity for me to confront my own rage right now. And if I confront it, if I become intimate with it, and if I release it, I will be ready to forgive everyone else. And that's where it starts. That's where the right. change in collective consciousness starts. You know, in, in my own relationship with my wife, and we've been married for many years, we have a lot of children together, and, uh, and there are times in that relationship when um, I would say to her occasionally, this doesn't sound like love, the way we talk to each other. Because, I mean, I've always said that your soulmate is really the person that you can hardly stand sometimes, right? <laughs> Not the person who agrees with you on everything that you say. I mean, my wife knows how to push the buttons. She's, she's very good at that. Uh, and I always think of her, and, and, and I've talked about this um, on many occasions, that the people who can push the buttons are our greatest teachers because they teach us that we haven't mastered ourselves yet. And anyone who can take us away from our peace, and anyone individually in our lives who can say the thing that sends us into that frenzy is really a great teacher not someone who just agrees with us. So that when I ask my wife if she really loves me, and do you love me because of all the things that I've been able to provide for you, or do you really love me? She said, "That's you call yourself a spiritual person? How could you even ask a question like that? You think I love you because of the money you've made or because of the fame that you have? That's, that's absurd. She said, I want you to know that I'm insulted by that. I will always love you. And I love you for who you are. And it doesn't make any difference to me what you've done. She said, I would miss you, but I will always love you. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> she knows exactly what to say, <laughs> what button to push. <laughs> but in our relationship, what we began to practice, and it's one of the things I think we can practice as we go out into the world in terms of what this is about here this, uh, this afternoon or this evening, about how to change the world, is that when you have a choice in your relationship with your spouse or your ex-spouse or your in-laws or strangers on the freeway or flight attendants or waiters or whomever, to be right or to be kind, that just begin to pick kind. That's like one of the great exercises you can do. And I'm telling you, that transformed our relationship. That when, when we will often kid each other and say that, oh, you're not being right right now, this is being kind, oop, there it is. You know? And when you're in a relationship for a long time, there, the ego really begins to surface on a regular basis. You know? and, uh, and watching that and, and, and saying to yourself, if somebody, the idea that, I have to defend myself, or the idea that, that somebody says something to me that I like, but they're wrong, and I can't just suspend my ego and say, 
thanks for sharing that. Having you point out what a jerk I am is really going to help me on my spiritual path. <laughs> or to think that. And you laugh at that and people think and listen to that and they say, well, that's just absolutely outrageous. But why is it outrageous? Why is it that we make this ego, this part of us that feels that we're separate from each other and separate from our environment and separate from God, why is it that we can't just suspend that and say, what do I want? What do I want as an individual in my life? All I want is to be at peace. That's all I want. And what is enlightenment? It's being immersed in and surrounded by peace. So I need to know that any time anybody is around me, individually or collectively, who takes me away from my peace is the greatest teacher I could have. So in a sense, Deepak, I think that uh, what's happening over in, on the subcontinent of India and Pakistan is something that, can, that is teaching all of us an incredibly great lesson. Can we choose peace? You know, and as the a people. first way we can do it is by looking at our own ego. Mm. Now, Carlos Castaneda, whose uh, writings we have both read many right. times, and call each other about, he says self-importance and uh, self-pity are the same thing. You are not self-important unless you're feeling sorry for yourself. So self-pity is is uh, is what it's really all about. You feel important when you are sorry for yourself. And it can be at a national level right now, or it can be at an individual level. It's a mask for the ego. And the only thing we can do is to see it for ourselves. In one of his most elegant uh, chapters, I think it's in the Bar of Silence, he says, if you are self-important, then it will make it necessary for you to remain offended for the rest of your life. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. This morning, I remember I was reciting that great American Indian poem. It says, now and then I go about pitying myself, which is self-importance. Now and then I go about pitying myself, and all the while my soul is being blown by great winds across the sky. And for me, I find that any time I feel even a little bit of that, I, I look into another person's eyes and I say namaste in, inside. And just do that, you know, it puts me on a level of equality. Remember the, the, the great story of the jaguar? Yeah. When he was being chased by the jaguar, when Carlos was being chased by a jaguar for three days and three nights when he was with his teacher, Don Juan Matus and the inaugural Julian. And this jaguar was getting closer and closer, and he was li living with more and more fear. And the anxiety was just higher, and he was now 50 feet away. And the, and the jaguar hadn't eaten, and uh, his teacher, Carlos's teacher, said to him, when the jaguar catches up to us, and he will, he will eat you and not me. And Carlos said, but uh, how can you be so sure that? He says, because you believe that you can't get away. And I know that I can. I know that I can. And so finally, after three days of this terror, they managed to escape and they got up. And I think the whole thing was an illusion myself, that he had manufactured this jaguar. It, wasn't, uh, it was just an illusion in his mind. But at any rate, after the three days, they sat there and the jaguar now disappeared and walked away. And they were having this discussion. He was having a discussion with his teacher. And his teacher said to him, now during the three days that you were being chased by this jaguar who was going to make a meal of you. He said, were you offended by the jaguar? Were you offended? And Carlos responded, no. He said, I wasn't offended. I just wanted him to go away. And you remember his final line? He said, that's how you have to treat the onslaughts of all of your fellow human beings. You have to allow them to be what they are and ask them to go away. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful line. It'll be a great lesson in Castaneda. And he also said that freedom, if you want something called freedom, and that's again, individually or collectively, it means that you have to stop thinking about yourself. I think that's a great exercise. I remember one of the meditations that we had to practice at this event that I went to a few years ago. It was a week-long thing studying on meditation. And we had to leave in our minds we had to leave our body. And then we had to look at our body sitting there meditating. 
And then we had to leave the city that we were in. It was actually out in the country. And then we had to leave the whole country. Then we had to get outside of, of the uh, planet, and we had to leave the whole planet and get out into space. And we had to look back from being out in space in our minds at this being sitting there. And then came the toughest one for the ego. We had to imagine ourselves looking at the earth without us on it. It's a great exercise in your ego because I remember when I was down in Australia and I, uh, I don't drink alcohol any longer. I took enough for two lifetimes earlier. So. And I was looking for an alcohol-free beer. And I walked into several bars down there and I said, do you have any alcohol beer down here in, in Sydney? And there was an old drunk sitting there at the bar and he looked over at me and he said, alcohol-free beer? He said, what the hell is the point? <laughs> And I have a feeling, that, I mean, I felt the same way when you look back at the earth and try to imagine the earth without you on it with the same response, like, what's the point? Like, what do we need an earth for if I'm not on it? <laughs> it's a great test for the ego. What the ego does is it projects its own securities to others. And that this phenomenon of projection is something that we usually are not aware of till, till we start paying a little attention some very frequent symptoms of projection. We feel misunderstood all the time. If you feel misunderstood all the time, you're projecting. We ask others for their opinion, and when they give it to us, we are really upset if it, they don't agree with us. We get threatened by authority figures just because somebody is wearing a uniform or has driving a police car, and he comes by and suddenly our heart starts thumping. It's projection. We have difficulty reading faces. We um, finish other people's sentences <laughs> for them. Uh, when two people are close, and especially if they're man and woman, we automatically assume there's something sexual going on. So these are all projections yeah, close of to me the here, ego. Deepak, if you don't mind, to stand over on the other side of the stage. Okay. <laughs> little projection so, there. And the only way you can really conquer this is by becoming aware of it. And if you become aware of it, you recognize that the only way to connect with people is through equality and sensitivity and, uh, and honesty and integrity. But equality comes first. In any relationship, well, one is superior or inferior, forget, forget it. It's not going to happen. I think it's a lot of it is just about the, that concept of love. I mean, that, that CD that you've put out, that uh, <laughs> Deepak and Friends, I mean, that is that poetry, I don't know how many of you have been able to hear that, but I mean, it is just so stunning to listen to this mystic from the 13th century telling us all, all, what it takes to get along. We just have to understand that we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. As spiritual beings, this is not our home. And once we get that, and we start looking at each other in a way that is connected, and that's one of the hardest things. I mean, when I was writing about this idea of synchronicity uh, 10, 15 years ago in a book called You'll See It When You Believe It, I was trying to think of what are the connectors? Like, how can I convey to people that we're connected to them when our whole way of processing everything is in terms of what we can see and feel and touch and experience with our senses. How can we connect without our senses in, in a different way? How can we send that kind of love? Did you tell the story earlier about the rabbit in... Um, in uh, I've in told it elsewhere, not today. It's, a, it's, like, it's one of the most profound stories of... I mean, they were feeding this rabbit poison. Well, you tell it. You know the story. Well, it's an Ohio State University a study that was published in Science, I'm sure some of you heard me speak of it before, where scientists were feeding rabbits diets that were extremely high in cholesterol, but they found that in one group of rabbits, the cholesterol wouldn't go up or they wouldn't get hardening of the arteries. And after a lot of investigation, they discovered that the only difference between these rabbits and the ones that were getting the high cholesterol was that the technician who was feeding them, he would pet them and cuddle them and kiss them before he gave them the poisonous food. But as a result of this experience of love or transfer of intelligence or compassion or whatever, 
they created neuropeptides or neurochemicals that transferred the cholesterol into a completely different metabolic pathway. You know, there are three components to this experience of love. One is affection, which means touching. We're a society that's very afraid of touching. Affection is touching. Attention is listening. Appreciation, three A's. Attention, affection, appreciation. If you remember nothing, just remember that and your life will change. Touch and allow yourself to be touched. It's okay. There was this very interesting study by a European psychologist. He went around the world. He would sit in cafes. He would observe how frequently couples touched each other. In Latin America, he found that the average number of tactile contacts per hour was 180. So they say, hey, Wayne, how are you? <laughs> right. Really missed you, guy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know? You're enjoying How this, are you doing? You <laughs> didn't share today. <laughs> so in Latin America, 180 tactile contacts per hour. He went to some of the Latin countries, you know, Italy and so on. It was the Paris. It was about half of that, about 90 tactile contacts per hour. Then he went to Gainesville, Florida, and it was two. And then he went to England, and he waited and waited, and nothing happened. <laughs> now, when I heard that, I said, you should study, and Sweden and places like that, just stay away from each other. You should examine the epidemiology, as they call it, of cardiovascular disease in these places. It mirrors even that. There are studies that now show that smoking, hypertension, cholesterol, overweight are not the major predictors of coronary artery disease. We know that. Today, the people who die of cardiovascular accidents before the age of 65, before the age of 65, people who die of cardiovascular accidents, the majority of them do not have the standard risk factors, which means more than 50% have none of these risk factors. Studies at Duke University School of Medicine have shown that hostility is the predictor more than anything else. The number one predictor is hostility. Number two predictor is job dissatisfaction. More people die in our culture and our civilization on Monday morning at 9 o'clock which is a stunning accomplishment for which only the human species can take credit. And hostility. There are studies that show that when you feel hostility and aggressive behavior, not anger. Anger is all right. You feel angry and you let it go. It's a response to a situation sometimes. But when you have this need to get back, that's hostility. The people who are experiencing hostility, the, the electromagnetic activity around the heart becomes chaotic. And this is, can be picked up through what are called heart wave coherence studies, not a standard EKG. But you can see that. And one of the institutes in California says, suggests any time you feel overshadowed by anything, just even in the midst of that, allow your awareness to go to your heart. It's called, the technique is called freeze frame. Just stop for a minute and allow your awareness to go to your heart and feel what's happening there. And they say that just doing that will change the, the chaotic electromagnetic field around your heart because you become aware of what's happening in your body as a result of that. So the antidote for, for war is peace and harmony and laughter and love inside our own hearts. Yeah. The um, book that I want to write in the future is... Um, I've got a working title that says... Uh, Stop giving energy to the things you don't believe in. And I think that's really a good summary of, of uh, field energy, how we can change our field, uh, how much of our individual energy we're placing on what we don't want, and learning to shift it to what we do want. Let's all place our collective attention on less violence in our world. Let's put more of our attention on the kindness. Let's take our attention off of entertainment and violence as being in some way connected.
any more than pleasure and cigarette smoking are, and shift our awareness. Poetically, I read a poem last night. I'll read just a part of it from Ella Wheeler Wilcox. She says it. The poets always say it so beautifully. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grieve, and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. Succeed and give, and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a long and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. Laugh. Think what you want. Put the attention on beauty and joy fulfillment, and we'll change the energy pattern of our individual lives and our collective lives. Deepak? This one last uh, story as you were reading that poem is a classic Indian story which has been retold all over the world in many forms. About two strangers come to a village. And they go to a wise man. And the first one goes and he says, you know, I'm thinking of settling down in this village. Can you tell me what kind of people live here. And the wise man says, tell me what kind of people lived in the place you're coming from. He says, they were all rogues and criminals and cheats and bigots and ethnocentric and couldn't stand them, etc. He says, you know, exactly the same people live here. <coughs> and then the other fellow comes to the same wise man. He says, I'm thinking of settling here. What kind of people <laughs> live here? And the old man says, what kind of people lived in the place you're coming from? And he said, they were the sweetest people in the world. They're the most compassionate, the most loving, the most giving, the most grateful. And the old man says, um, exactly those people live here. So, you know, wherever we go, there we are. <laughs> we create what we want. I guess every morning you... Thank you. I think every morning we have a choice. You look out, you open the window, and you say, Good morning, God. Or you say, Good God, morning. <laughs> it's up to you. This has been a Hay House audiobook production. If you would like a free catalog of audio cassettes, books, and videos offered by Hay House, please call us at 1-800-654-5126. Thank you for listening.